get into change without you. Feel the pleasure that I found you. And if I could, I would have had this all the time. Hello, everybody. Um, just a quick note, if anybody wants interpretation in Bahasa, you can scan this code in your phone. If you need interpretation in Bahasa, we have an interpreted, interpreter ready. Thank you. Hello and good morning, everybody. My name is Amna Khan and I'm from Fair for All Asia program. And today I welcome you all to this side event of G20 Indonesia 2022. Um, the title for today's event is Envisaging Wealth Tax in the Post-Pandemic World, A Mission Impossible to Reduce Inequality. The event is being organized by Prakarsa in collaboration with C20 G20 Indonesia 2022 and South Asian Alliance for Poverty Eradication. Today we will be, today we are gathered here to talk about socioeconomic unrest caused by COVID-19 and how it has pushed additional 150 to 170 million people in poverty in South Asia. We will also revisit wealth tax prospects and challenges for implementation in Asia. And we are gonna have a panel discussion and we will use this opportunity to launch two reports that are going to be focusing on the wealth tax in the Asian context. To formally welcome you all in today's event, I would like to invite I would like to invite Ms. Herni Ramdan Ingram, who is the co-chair of C20 and the program manager of Prakarsa. Ms. Herni. Uh, hello, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, uh, selamat pagi everyone. Uh, I'm Herni. Thank you, Amna, for uh, opening this session. Uh, first of all, let me allow you to welcome all of you to our side event of the G20 with the title of Envisaging Wealth Tax in the Post-Pandemic World, a Mission Impossible to Reduce Inequality. Uh, so, uh, as Amna said, this event is organized by uh, Prakarsa Sape with the support from Fair for All project in Asia. And then uh, maybe 
to, for those of you who haven't uh, known about the Prakarsa. Prakarsa is a think tank based organization. We are in Jakarta. We are working with uh, a lot of networks, including CSOs, universities, uh, media, and also we are one of the co-chair of the C20 Indonesia and also Sherpa of uh, C20 Indonesia. Um, we have heard a lot about how the inequality has been increased uh, dramatically during the pandemic. If we quote to, to Joseph Stiglitz, a uh, well-known economist, economist uh, he mentioned that since the beginning of the pandemic, the world 10 richest men have doubled their fortune, while a new billionaire has emerged every 26 hours. Uh, the world is beginning to reach the magnitude of inequalities uh, in income and wealth and wealth tax, and that has remarked our societies. Uh, thus, we must to enact a fair individual tax for those who work as for those who work for a living are enforced to pay larger portion of their income tax than those who enjoy the fruits and the windfall of the pandemic uh, 2020, 2020 to until now, basically. So, uh, but we know that the current reality is that the very rich people uh, pay lower percentage of their reported income than, the, than what they should do. And their reported income is often a fraction of their actual income. It has never been uh, revealed the true uh, amount of their wealth. A pack of regulation are existed in many countries, especially in Asia, but also with the, a lot of pack of exemption. So basically at, at the end of the day, the tax regulation for the rich people is useless. Um, taxing rich people's gain from capital can help to reduce inequality while keeping up overall prosperity, yet only with two conditions. I think uh, later on, the, uh, the four presenters will provide you some information about how actually public, parliament, government, and other stakeholders perceive about the wealth tax. Uh, fortunately, there is no uh, significant resistance about when we are discussing about wealth tax, but most of them discuss about the critical remarks that how the tax uh, revenue should be utilized or spending. These two conditions are including the revenues from the taxation must be invested in public infrastructure, such as school, education, health, public, trans public transport, and also it has to pay attention to the care economy. We know that women's gender inequality is also created by how women cannot access to the employment or uh, to the labor market. And then uh, the, the wealth tax can be one of the option how to strengthen the care economic system. We have to move forward and then change our perspective on seeing unpaid care work as something uh, by giving a lot of contribution to our economy appreciating women's time and giving them economic status of the works they have never recognized before. And in addition, with more volatile energy and food price, fostering social cohesion seems to be important. People must stand together. And in this regard, the growing of wealth gap is a risk that we might consider worth reducing. On today's discussion, uh, we are going to hear from uh, some of the distinguished speakers from Prakarsa, from SAPE, from Tafgia, and from INSAF. We have they uh, we have those who are very expert in uh, their field, especially when they talk about the wealth tax. And I'm sure that we are going to have a very uh, rich discussion from the mathematical modeling, uh, the case of the country level, from the perspective of gender, and also legal framework. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who come here, for the speakers who come here all the way down from their own countries. Some uh, had to take flight for like 28 hours. Thank you very much. Hope you had a good rest last night and then no one fall asleep when discussing about tax today. Uh, and then we can bring forward what we discussed today uh, further, maybe some of the real action on how to, to not stopping the well tax issues in this room, but also uh, you know, echoing this to the G20 leaders. That's all from my side. Thank you, Amna. Good morning.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Harini, for mentioning that how in inequality has increased and there is a possible solution for us, and that is Wealth Text. This is why we all are gathered here to not only discuss our discuss it between ourselves, but take it further and make sure that we fulfill our responsibilities. Um, to take the discussion forward, I would like to call Mr. Jakshai Shamtongdi, who is lead for Fair for All Asia. Mr. Jakshai, can you please come on the stage and introduce us to the discussions and all the presentations that we will be presenting today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amna. Uh, good morning. Salamat pagi. <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Herni and the Pakasa team, together with SAPE and the C20s for inviting me to be part of this exciting event. Um, as Herney mentioned, there's a lot for us to go through today, and uh, especially in this very moment where the G20 is going to happen in this great island, uh, we are going to discuss the very key issues, especially after the world has gone to, you know, COVID, the pandemic, all the challenges to see how we can tackle both issues, which are, for me, equally important. One is to create economic possibilities, and everyone talking about this. But we want to create it in the way that, at the same time, create social equity, you know, fairness and justice. And I believe after the session today, I think this is maybe not mission impossible, but mission possible. So let's see how it goes. Uh, and we go, we have the great chance to hear the release of two reports, which hasn't been discussed or the information been released anywhere before from South Asia and from Indonesia. And after that, we're going to have panel discussion. So um, I invite um, to present the report uh, with me, join me on the stage, um, Samira Hanim and Irvan Tenku Haja from Pakasa, please. Maybe from uh, at the far end of that panel. So Irvan, okay. And then at the same time, uh, we're going to have uh, Josna Cha and Suhir Shreta from uh, uh, South Asia uh, to join us, join me on the stage. So please, Josna and Suhir. Okay, Suhir, can you can put anything? Please. Okay, so um, for 20 minutes each, um, you, we start with Pakasa, and we hear from Indonesia on the latest uh, situation in relation to inequality and the possibilities of uh, exploring wealth, you know, and related tax scheme. So um, who will go first? Um, Samira or Irvin? Okay, please, the floor is yours. You have uh, the, the mic. Thank you very much, Mr. Jesse. May I stand? Okay, thank you very much. Introducing my name is Irfan Tangkuharja from the Prakasa. And then with my colleague Samira Hanim, I would like to uh, present our uh, research reports. That's the, our uh, title of the research, Implementation of Wealth Tax in Indonesia, Potency and Opportunities. So this presentation is extracted from our uh, research reports. Uh, next. So we've done this uh, research reports around more than a uh, month ago, I think, yeah. I think a month ago we finalized this research and then we started to do this research in the February, last February or the early March. Ah, so this is uh, how the way we conduct research uh, by the qualitative descriptive. So we use the data collection using the three uh, approaches. First, the literature study, policy and regulation. We study the policy and regulation in Indonesia regarding to the taxation issues. And also, we also studying uh, journal and articles related to the uh, taxation issue, either in Indonesia or abroad practice. Conducted interview uh, with the uh, member of uh, parliaments and high net worth individuals, mission, and also uh, civil society organizations uh, practitioners. 
and also ministerial uh, bodies like uh, tax authorities and fiscal another fiscal bodies. And also we conduct a uh, focus group discussion with Islamic scholars to uh, know or to understand what's this, the relations between the wealth tax and uh, in uh, with the zakat uh, conception in uh, Indonesia in Islam. I mean. And next. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I forget. This is the first time I use this tool. <laughs> so at least the first background of why we think the wealth tax is needed. First is the poverty and inequality. As we can see on the top uh, graphic, the poor, this one, this one, we can see that the Indonesian government has experiencing a uh, slow progress, uh, has experiencing uh, slow progress in uh, poverty alleviations. As we can see that the from March, uh, 2018 to March 2022, we only experiences a down uh, poverty rates very, very slight, very, very slight. And also we can see that the poverty line as of March 2022 uh, has increased from around uh, 450,000 some to 500 uh, and 5,000, uh, this one. So if we uh, convert to the US dollars using the uh, on the October 28, it's equal to around 32.5 US dollar. So in Indonesia, as you see that if you spend a month 50 uh, bucks, you are not poor, it means. So we can see that in Indonesia, there are 26.16 uh, million people live with the spending average uh, monthly under this uh, value. So we can see. Meanwhile, we can see during the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic era in the 2020 and 2021, the wealth growth of the Indonesian riches, in average, has increased significantly. In average, as we can see, the the, the richest man in Indonesia experienced the increase of the, his wealth, and also, but the second uh, has uh, experienced the decrease of his wealth. But in average. They experience the high increase in equality. Meanwhile, as we can see that the poverty lines has increased during the pandemic and so on. Uh, this is, uh, I only show you the 25 Indonesian riches, but uh, actually I would like to uh, put 100 Indonesian riches, but uh, we have a limited space, so I, can, I couldn't do it. <laughs> and also the inequality, as we can see that the rich of the national wealth. This is uh, from. Okay. Next. Check, check, check. Yeah. Uh, based on the World Inequality Report this year, the richest 1% in Indonesia captures 30% of the national wealth. Meanwhile, the 49% of the populations only uh, share 65% of the wealth of populations. This is the face of our the inequality in Indonesia. And then the second background, why we think the wealth tax is needed, is necessity. As we can see that the tax revenue versus GDP in Indonesia, uh, they are going like an linearity, an linearity. We can see that this, uh, the last year, the Indonesian GDP, the Indonesian, the Indonesian GDP reached uh, almost 17 quadrillion uh, rupiah, while the tax revenue only touched 1.5 thousand uh, trillion rupiah. So the tax ratio uh, in the last uh, five years, we can see has showing the decreasing trend, downtrend. So it, we can see from this data that there is a paradoxal situation in the economic growth and also the what's the tax collection performance conducted by the uh, government <laughs> in here. That's why we uh, think we need uh, to conduct a research why the wealth tax is needed. 
And then what is the wealth tax? I will give you a brief uh, uh, definition and concept about the wealth tax. Wealth taxes are imposed on the holding of wealth, the transfer of wealth, or the appreciation of wealth. Uh, taxes on the holding of wealth uh, tax a person's net worth means as assets minus liabilities. Taxes on the transfer of wealth refer to inheritance taxes, estate taxes, and taxes on donations and gifts. Tax, taxes on the appreciation of wealth take the form of capital uh, gains tax. And then wealth threshold and tariff in the wealth tax applied in several countries is various in each country. And also frequency is also uh, uh, various, but we have two types of the frequency or the time collection of the wealth tax. First, one off only during in the extraordinary fiscal circumstances or a recurring or annual. And the subject who, who is the subject of the wealth tax is the high net worth individual. Uh, according to the uh, definition uh, of the uh, high net worth individual from the Forbes, uh, he or she is the person who holds the net worth more than one million uh, US dollar of their total assets. And then this is the uh, pictures of, or, the, or the examples where the uh, wealth tax uh, uh, is applied or is uh, going to be applied. In Colombia, the new president, for instance, the Gustavo Petro, uh, proposed the uh, wealth tax draft to the House and then uh, now is uh, under discussions with the tariff progressive 0 0.5 up to 1% with the threshold 1.3 million US dollar in France. They also have been applying wealth tax since a long time ago. I forget exactly uh, since what year in Norway. Uh, the tariff is flat 0.7%, but a double, a double tax imposition both in uh, local government and also in national uh, governments. In national governments, uh, the tariff is 0.25%. In Spain, progressive tariff, and in the Switzerland also. And the Ar Argentines is one of the examples for the country which uh, implements wealth tax one of the Argenti Argentine uh, proposed wealth tax in the last 2020 and applied the wealth tax in the 2021 for uh, tackling the uh, crisis. Uh, <laughs> of the uh, pandemic COVID-19. And the uh, Philippines is uh, on the table, I think, Mr. Tony, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's on the dra draft with the tariff progressive one up to 3%. And then this is our formula in determining wealth tax potency in Indonesia. So we have uh, calculated uh, wealth tax potency uh, using a five model, uh, model one, model two, and uh, up to model uh, five with the tax, uh, various tax bracket uh, from the USD 1 million up to uh, more than four, four, uh, 40, 140 million US dollar with this uh, flat. So, and the model one means that uh, a person who holds a net worth equal or more than 1 million US dollar is imposed tax 1% and so on. But the model five is only uh, like uh, uh, information because this is a Thomas Piketty model where the the, the wealth tax uh, of, of tariff is fol uh, following the average of the wealth. So uh, the uh, for instance, zero point one percent for the three point four million is there. But if the wealth is bigger than than uh, then this lower bracket, so the tariff will uh, follow this one, but times, times, two times higher, two times higher than the uh, progressive uh, normal uh, model. So the this is uh, our uh, uh, simple formula, revenue potency equal to net worth times tax rates, and then the results times wealth taxpayers. And Based on the data we uh, we collect from the Statista, uh, there is a 21,430 uh, persons or sit Indonesian citizens who holds a net worth more than uh, 1 million US dollars. And then uh, for the top 100 percent, we use uh, data from the Forbes.
So this is our calculation for the for each model. We can see that if we apply or implement the model one, we will generate the tax revenue here, uh, 1.9 uh, quadrillion, uh, uh, what uh, million, uh, billion, sorry, 1.9 billion US dollar. And if we implement a model two, we will generate tax revenue 3.8 billion US dollar and so on. So this is our proposal uh, based on our uh, long discussions and also uh, interviews with the experts <coughs> and our in another informant. So I we think the researchers thinks that the model three is uh, for temporarily for now uh, for temporarily is the best choice if the government of Indonesia uh, would uh, like to uh, implement this a wealth tech. What is the model three? Model three of the well text. We can see the previous slide. Sorry. The bracket or the threshold of the minimum wealth is 10 million US dollars. So the citizen who holds networks equal or more than uh, 10 million US dollar uh, convert to rupiah around 144 uh, billion rupiah are subject to be tax, wealth tax, I mean, and uh, with the uh, uh, tariff 1% minimum. So this is the bracket of the tariffs, as we can see from the bracket, uh, the lowest bracket, 10 to 15 US million dollar, uh, uh, is imposed tariff 1% and so on. So the subject of the wealth tax, as I said before, uh, high net worth individual representing family, so he or she is not an uh, individual like uh, this individual, but uh, representing family with the cut off of net worth uh, equal or more than uh, 144 uh, uh, billion rupiah with the object covering assets and transfer of wealth. Assets consist of saving, bank account, shares, warrants, state securities, obligation, and precious metals, and transfer of wealth, inheritance, donation, and grant. And time of collection is imposed annually. And report mechanism as we uh, use of uh, uh, routinely or annually when we report our uh, tax report using the self-assessment or surat pemberitahuan tahunan in Indonesia with the verification from the tax authority, uh, uh, general uh, directorate of the taxation. With but uh, we think that we have to give like a relaxation for the tax well taxpayer with the one year relaxation. Uh, to pay uh, their uh, obligation. And we estimate the taxpayer with this model is 4,714 uh, persons. So the, the question arises is then uh, it will be a burden for the uh, super rich or the high net worth individual, and it will uh, reduce their growth of wealth. And then to answer their uh, this issue, we did uh, simulations on three uh, investment instruments, deposits, gold, and also after this stock. And then uh, based on our calculation, the investor who holds 11 million US dollar when he or she uh, deposit their uh, money to the, the uh, bank deposit, and then the uh. wealth tax is imposed, the wealth tax will not reduce the growth of their wealth. And it also five, five minutes left. Five minutes left. Okay. Yeah. And also, yeah. It, okay. Yeah. It also works for the gold, and also works for the uh, stock simulations. So compared to the another types of the uh, 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 compared to the another several tax types, 
the revenue from the wealth tax around 78.9 uh, uh, trillion rupiah or equal to 4.1 billion US dollar. It's higher, even is higher than the twice tax amnesty in Indonesia in 2016 and the 2022. And next is what the member of parliament says about the wealth tax. We we try to reach well, as as many as we could reach, but and then we uh, we got the information from the 61 member of parliaments and 47 or 70, 70, 77 percent of them favoring wealth tax idea, and then. Unlike the prakarsa, unlike the prakarsa proposal where the wealth tax will be uh, implemented uh, annually, they prefer once in five years. And then this is, uh, may I have one minute after this slide? Okay. So after that, uh, this is the critical remarks from the high net worth individuals we interviewed. Okay, wealth tax could. Uh, be supported by the super rich, they think. But in conditions, at least these four conditions, real regulation on wealth distribution, they want to ear market tax. I'm, I'm, uh, they think the wealth tax revenue shall be uh, passed directly for these uh, things. Tax for food, tax for health, tax for education, tax for humanitarian assistance. And justice in law enforcement, like a strict sanction for tax efficient, and improvement in ease of doing business uh, and recognizing wealth taxpayer. Challenge and risk, challenge, tax policies, regulation, institution are not yet ready, assessment of taxpayer wealth data uh, and complex valuation of property values and problematic tax collection. The risk, tax evasion, capital flag, and uh, another uh, high net worth individual resistance. And then, uh, my colleagues will continue the presentations. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Irfan. Uh, and the next one is uh, we study. Yeah, uh, we also study about zakat or the per perspective of wealth tax in Islam, because this uh, when we do the study, uh, this is supported by the billionaires of billion billionaires of humanity, and we want to know about how the perspective of wealth of tax of taxes in an Islamic. Uh, uh, no, majority of Muslim in a country. So Indonesia is a very best uh, is the very best example, I guess. And we also conduct the study comparing with Indonesian zakat collection and also uh, Malaysia. So the history of wealth tax in Islam is that uh, from the uh, from the uh, like a decade era uh, in Islam, uh, there there are a lot of people and a lot of. Uh, increasing a number of people of poor people that unable to meet the basic needs so that the uh, the country need to have like uh, some income and it's conducted in islam country we call it zakat and also there are several types of zakat in uh, in islam uh, the best uh, uh, sorry the obligatory one is zakat al fitrah that we pay this zakat is once in a year or annually in Ramadan, and also there's a zakat mal. Zakat mal is based on asset or wealth. So this is very similar, like uh, the concept of wealth tax. Uh, okay. So the second practices. Uh, for the application of wealth tax in Indonesia, there are several regulations in Indonesia about zakat. In uh, there are uh, uh, articles 22 and 23 in uh, Indonesian uh, Indonesian law, and also for the director director general of taxes that zakat in Indonesia is practices to be the uh, as a net income deduction, and in Malaysia zakat is uh, pract the, the practices of zakat is for the tax deduction. So for the net income deduction, so when everyone uh, in Indonesia have to pay taxes uh, in, for their uh, income taxes, so we, if, uh, for example, I, I have to pay my zakat and I collected the zakat for the uh, zakat, uh, zakat uh, body, 
uh, and then I have to take this zakat payment to the to uh, deduction my uh, my income, and then my taxes will be uh, slow will be lower. And in Malaysia, if someone pay zakat, so they don't have to pay taxes anymore. So the zakat is uh, also the taxes. So the uh, the country in Malaysia, uh, zakat is in the same uh, regulation with uh, taxes. Yeah, this is this this one is very interesting part about the zakat counted in Indonesia and Malaysia. As you can see in a yellow block, that in Indonesia, comparing to Malaysia, Malaysia is ten times. Uh, zakat the zakat collection in Malaysia is 10 times higher than Indonesia annually. In Indonesia in 2019, uh, the zakat collection is 74 uh, USD, US dollar, and in Malaysia is 650 uh, US dollar. This is the problem and challenges and opportunities for the zakat collection in Indonesia and Malaysia. In Indonesia, there are a lot uh, for the challenges that there are a lot of people that uh, the lot, a lot of of wealth people in Islam that they don't believe to collect the zakat from the government bodies. Uh, there are they think that when they give the money for everyone that who needs the zakat, they just need uh, they just give the money from. Uh, the family and also the neighbor maybe and everyone so the zakat collection in indonesia is very low in a uh, basnas basnas is a uh, 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 zakat body in indonesia zakat national body in indonesia the call the potential zakat receipt in 2020 is 20 billion but the collection is only 4 billion so it's just like 20 percent of the potential okay. and there are some opportunities from our yeah, one minute. There are some opportunities from our uh, focus group discussion with uh, all the Islamic uh, perspective that uh, Indonesia has grown their uh, Muslim majority, uh, Muslim people, Muslim. There are a lot of uh, Muslims, and they think that zakat is very important, and they want to give their zakat to give to the needy people like poor people or maybe someone that very need this this is very related to our wealth tax concept that we want to give uh, the zakat to recovery for the pandemic i think that's all from me thank, thank you. you so much and sorry for you know keep uh, you know <laughs> reminding you about the time now now we move from indonesia to south asia context and we'll start with suhir So, so here you have 10 minutes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Sudhir Shrestha uh, from South Asia Alliance for Poverty Eradication. Who We work uh, in South Asia and the Secretariat ba is based in uh, Kathmandu, uh, Nepal. So we work in uh, all the South Asian countries uh, which uh, encompasses um, Bangladesh, uh, India, uh, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Maldives. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, so we uh, this is the uh, I'll just be briefly summarizing uh, the main findings of the report and uh, uh, Jochna will uh, speak on the country specific issues especially with the focus on india since uh, the next g20 is happening in india and india occupies the major portion of uh, south asia the issue of india uh, should be highlighted more and she will be focusing on that so Yeah, so uh, in South Asia, uh, we are having multiple crises. So we just have made some progress uh, uh, on the field of recovery after COVID-19. 
Uh, however, uh, still uh, the issue of, for instance, the huge flood in Pakistan that shows the extent of uh, climate crisis uh, in which the contribution of the region is the least. And similarly, we have financial crisis in Sri Lanka as well as in Pakistan. And Sri Lanka is already in, uh, has declared bankruptcy and is in negotiation with the IMF for rescue. And similarly, we have cost of living crisis with the supply chain crisis. We have been facing the problem of rising fuel prices due to which it is very difficult uh, for, uh, for the uh, South uh, Asian poor to uh, make living. Then, um, so fine, fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, then uh, we, uh, the problem is this has entrenched the wealth and in income inequality in the region. Suppose the statistics show that 150 to 170 million in Asia uh, have uh, become have become poor, have uh, run below poverty line during the period of the COVID-19. And in this regard, the rich have become more richer, like initially in the opening remarks, like Harney said about how during the period of the COVID, in every 26 hours, there has been a rise of a billionaire. Yeah. So we can see the income inequality uh, and wealth inequality in these figures, like uh, 1.8 trillion growth in uh, the wealth of the billionaires during the period of COVID-19 and in Asia, and 7% in the number of high net worth individuals in Asia. And wh while uh, during this time, the uh, in case of South Asia, the bottom 50% uh, holds only 5% of the wealth, while the top 10% in South Asia owns 60% uh, of the wealth. So this shows the stark wealth inequality in the region, while uh, the in case of income inequality, it has been found that the extent of in income inequality in the disposable income has the potential to reduce growth by one to 4%, which means that the reduction in uh, growth is also possible due to inequality and inequality does not affect simply the poor, but the entire economy as a whole. Yeah, so this figure shows, if you uh, see the blue and the gray, uh, that shows the difference between the wealth inequality while the red and the uh, yellow uh, shows the difference between in income inequality, which clearly indicates that wealth inequality is becoming more of a prominent issue uh, in the region in South Asia. This is uh, the data of 2021 taken from, uh, calculated from World Inequality Database 2022. Uh, so uh, this, uh, in this context, we are, uh, we did, we conducted this research and the author of this research is Luke Gibson. With due th thanks to him, I'm presenting the findings uh, from this report, which has this major focus of uh, taxing the holding of wealth, which means net wealth tax, uh, and taxing the transfer of wealth, which refers to the introduction of inheritance and gift taxes, and taxes increase in value of the wealth, which uh, indicates capital gains tax and finally the this is not the wealth tax as such but very important especially through, uh, after we went through the COVID-19 crisis the, that is taxing the corporate windfall gain tax uh, <clears throat> which taxes the excess profit. Yeah. So uh, this is the revenue potential of wealth tax. In this case, we have shown the, pro, uh, uh, the revenue that could be generated uh, from uh, the progressive wealth tax. And the progressive in this case, uh, mean uh, the rate we have fixed is uh, one uh, three percent from uh, the of the uh, those taxing at three percent uh, to those individuals, high net in, uh, net worth individuals with range 
of wealth between 5 million and 50 million, 5% 5 uh, tax rate for the people with net worth 50 million to 1 billion and 10% for 1 billion above. And this clearly shows that in case, if you see in case of India, the progressive wealth tax can fund entire education spending. And uh, it can uh, uh, many times, uh, uh, more than two times, it can fund the healthcare spending. And in case of uh, other countries, uh, if Bangladesh, uh, it can uh, sponsor a portion of healthcare spending. And uh, the similar goes for Pakistan. And so these data are able, uh, is taken from Wealth X. Uh, report a uh, wealth acts database and uh, combining it with the Forbes uh, data. So this clearly shows the revenue potential of progressive wealth taxation. However, if we just uh, run around the uh, modeling and do uh, at 10 percent, get a flat tax rate at 10 percent, the potential is even higher. Uh, so it can fund entire education and health spending of uh, India. So, so this shows that while we are running, uh, scar uh, running the uh, having the scarcity for funding the public services, which was uh, seen, uh, which was uh, these cracks in the current system, is see, was clearly observed during the time of the pandemic. We can see that uh, we could have generated resources, and we still can generate resources for the uh, future, in which case these crises uh, will be evident mostly in the form of climate crisis, food crisis, or any other uh, similar uh, pandemic that may uh, unfortunately come. Yeah, so why wealth tax now? It's not just about the raising the revenue. Uh, the nature of the wealth tax is very progressive in nature, which takes us, uh, which takes the tax system very away uh, from the regressive nature that is currently prevailing with the dominance of the indirect taxation uh, that has a disproportionate effect on the poor and uh, it can reduce inequality and it has a very broad public support uh, because uh, the various opinion surveys have been conducted in especially in india which shows that the approval for the wealth taxation is above 80 percent from the public and this agenda has also been lately raised by uh, the Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods institutions like the imf and the world bank uh, and uh, they are on board the thing is we need to make the agenda uh, for our people by carefully making that sim it's not that about simply taxing the wealthy it's also about mobilizing it for the welfare of the people and the nitty-gritty of the policy should be very much pro poor so one minute okay so so finally we have the recommendations that we need to rebalance the tax system to as well taxation in which case uh, the uh, nature should be progressive with uh, progressive rates and the threshold um, should be such that the poor are not taxed. The poor may have some wealth which should not be taxed, so that the only the uh, so that the progressive nature of the taxation is justified. We need to minimize the exemptions because we have we uh, the problem in our countries is that we have good laws but we have a very long list of exemptions which really prevent its effective implementation and we need to take, take advantage of technological advances and most important we need to uh, collect after collection of these revenue we need to fund the uh, uh, fund the inequality reducing public services like education and health so <clears throat> Yeah, so we should not have any tax am, um, amnesties. And finally, uh, the windfall taxes we have proposed like 90% windfall gain tax only on the uh, excess profit uh, that they make during the time of the crisis like the uh, uh, pandemic. So the finally one uh, final sentence I would like to say is uh, like we have to make the entire taxation system uh, very responsive uh, to the uh, uh, for uh, in incorporating the gender issues uh, and incorporate a gender budgeting process and time bound targets uh, to make the system progressive towards the poor. Thank you. Thank you, Suhir. So from the overall situation in South Asia, we have now focused um, we chose now more with India, if okay. I understand correctly.
Good morning, salamat pagi. Um, um, yeah, I they will put the slides. Yeah, no, I'm waiting. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, I will actually uh, skip the slide because these are the facts that uh, he has already, uh, Sudhir has already uh, covered. So the point uh, to be made here is that South Asia as a reason, if you take it as a sub region of Asia and any region in the world, it, it has one of the highest inequalities of both income and wealth. And therefore it needs you know, to be acknowledged. And it's not limited to one country, large and small, all countries have high inequality. So that's the point of this slide. I'll go to the next. The next has come. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, what is the status? You know, everyone is arguing, starting from her to Sudhir. We are arguing for wealth tax. And so where does where do we stand? And it's not that it has not existed in South Asian countries. It has existed in various forms like uh, Sudhir was mentioning, windfall tax. So there's not, nothing called windfall tax. That's a category. And if you, if you look at uh, our histories, then you will find that different countries at different points of time have gone for that. But the implementation has been weak and the design has also not been, I, I'll say, honest. You know, so it has been there, but it has not been designed well, uh, uh, as he was saying, huge uh, exemptions. For example, gift tax has been reintroduced in india and the you know if, if you look at the exemption so it if then it has almost everybody is exempted and the definition of family is you know extends to your family by marriage so you know your your spouses cousins spouses uncles so it includes every you know a possible person that you can uh, uh, call a family so uh, the exemptions are so huge that it loses its meaning uh, when it comes to say inheritance. So everything you receive as gift and, and, and a lot of it comes in the form of inheritance from all kinds of uh, uh, families. So th that, that's a problem. And, and that applies to again, almost all the countries. And there have been uh, talks, especially so for example, post COVID, there was a lot of uh, uh, you know talk in the air that we will have at least 2% super rich uh, tax kind of a thing, but nothing happened. And uh, mm, so, if I can you go to, let me see this slide. Yeah. Yes. So there are some signs of change. It's not that uh, nothing we see, and uh, I'll say bet better late than never. So some of the recent changes are worth noting. But we should also say when we talk of say Sri Lanka and Pakistan, we should also remember that economies, especially Sri Lanka, collapsed. And after that, we see certain signs of changes uh, under, under uh, IMF conditionalities. And therefore, it's important that you know, the countries do not reach that stage. And, and inequality also contributes uh, to reaching that stage. If you have an unequal kind of a, a development and growth, that also causes. So what are the, some of the recent changes? So for example, Pakistan has uh, uh, increased corporate taxes uh, rates, 35 to 39, and that, that's, that's a good kind of a raise. And it has also in, uh, introduced a super tax on high earners. And uh, then they have also a kind of a super, super tax, which, is, which has a higher rate for very high income. And uh, again, Pakistan's economy has also uh, uh, been in bad shape. And, and uh, uh, some of this is because of the conditionalities. And we have our uh, colleague Aisha Ahmed from Lahore, Pakistan here. She may add more things later and you can direct your questions to her as well. If you want to know more about it, she may have more recent updates. Sri Lanka, again, is now uh, going for it, but we all know how the economy collapsed. India uh, did not have a, a like super rich surcharge as we were expecting. But it did have some export duty on petroleum products. As we know that international uh, prices were high and, and therefore petroleum companies were making a lot of profit and that was charged. But then it did face problems because of the uh, you know, price instability in the world market. Now, this is the slide I'm going to focus on. 
that why are we talking of wealth tax? Yes, we have heard about high inequalities and, and wealth tax can uh, help raise, but I think it's also important to unpack those inequalities and argue for that. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's important to say that when we are talking of inequalities and, and, and investment to, you know, uh, in a manner that your inequalities are uh, decreased, we also argue for, uh, uh, we also point out that we are not saying that that would not contribute to growth. So uh, we are talking of inclusive growth, but inclusive again can be, you know, can be not necessarily be inequality reducing. It's not also about status quo. We also want a change. We want a reduction in inequalities. And that I will try to explain through uh, using India's case through the last two slides that I have. So uh, if you look at India, it's also important that, you know, when we make international comparisons, we tend to say that, oh, India is, um, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, our government uh, keeps highlighting that, that, oh, we are so much better than others. Uh, um, which is true that, you know, if you look at the growth rates and all, it it, look, it seems to be better than others. But it's also important that we compare ourselves uh, uh, as compared to our own past. So in India, for example, if you, if you look at the India's own past, the economic slowdown started in 2016 following demonetization. Some of you would be aware. I won't go into detail at the moment, later if necessary. And uh, and then, of course, we had negative uh, growth rate during uh, the first year of COVID. And therefore, the growth rate seems high, but it's just, you know, coming out of uh, uh, a very, uh, coming out of the pit that you were. And therefore, the high growth rate doesn't mean uh, uh, much. What did we see it as, as in, in terms of government's response on fiscal uh, uh, measures in terms of taxation and others? One major thing that happened in 2019-20, which was just the year before COVID, uh, was a decline and, and, a, and a massive decline in corporate tax rate from 30% to 22%. And that was the argument was that that would, you know, uh, lead to higher investments and therefore higher employment creation. And therefore, it would also be inequality reducing. Nothing of that happened. Nothing of that happened. If you, if you look at everything, it basically investment rates continue to be low, and and that that's that's a major major worry, and and therefore uh, we have uh, mm, mm, very high uh, unemployment. I'll I'll, I'll uh, mm, come to that. Um, so investment rates are low. I have put the figures there, and then uh, another worrying thing is that even the growth, you know, supposedly relatively higher growth as compared to other countries lower as compared to our own past is also concentrated. I think that is a very, very important bit that it's, it's a jobless growth. And therefore it's, it's not, you know, that is also contributing to inequality. What's happening that it's a few corporate led growth. So your, uh, the, the benefits of growth is not translating itself into higher income distribution in higher uh, employment creation, and therefore it actually is pushing inequality further. It's exasperating the inequalities, and that, that's very uh, uh, clear if, if we look at it. High unemployment rate, again, if you look at the average unemployment rate, it's not that high. But if you separate the youth, which is what matters, uh, 18, uh, say 15, 24 year old, then it's very high. This is, these are ILO figures for, you know, three years average. And, and it puts us in the category of troubled conflict states like say Syria or uh, Iran, you know, which have similar kind of youth unemployment rates and which is much worse than say a country like Indonesia or Malaysia, you know, where the range is of 12 to 15, 16%. So these are the worrying part of the growth story. Even if you have growth, your it's not, changing inequality and therefore you need to focus on a different kind of uh, uh, model one minute yeah this is my last it changed yeah did it no ah, it did yeah so this is my last um 
So what do we need to do? One is this that, you know, we uh, have enough evidence. It's, it's high time that we have taxes like wealth tax. Uh, and we have now evidence that when we, we were putting, uh, you know, we were giving relaxations and putting our trust in, in this uh, uh, big corporates uh, to lead the growth that is not happening. And therefore, we need to transfer money. We need to go for a different economic development model, which is far more inclusive, which is far more pro-poor, which is far more pro-women, uh, small investors, uh, every, every, you know, rural employment. And we have, you know, we have very, very rigorous studies. I, I mean, our own center has done a multiplier and social accounting based study, which is now these days not in fashion because it's, it's very tedious kind of uh, uh, research. And it, it clearly showed us that investment in public education and health has far more distributive elements as compared to, you know, investing just in say very high infrastructure. I'm not saying infrastructure is not needed. What I'm saying that you also have to invest in other things and you have to have a very different model of investment. So we need resources, we need wealth tax and, and different forms of wealth tax to get that resource which can be invested. But it's also important that we spend that uh, in a very targeted manner where it actually distributes the wealth creates employment for the poor and generates uh, uh, mm, mm, income uh, uh, for future. And therefore, it's a very different kind of growth model that we are uh, 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 talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josna. Um, well, and thank you for all the presenters. Um, I need to give you a little bit of explanation. We will hold the Q&A uh, until the uh, session after next because we will have the panel discussion and then we will take questions. So those of you who have questions to a specific issues on the presentation, please note it down and we will have, we need to collect them and someone will pass it on to me, including for people who join online, you can post your questions and then we will collect those as well. So thank you so much for our presenters who joining me. I will invite you back again on the panel discussion but we are now going to move to the next session already. Thank you very much. So next I will invite um, an order to distinguish uh, speakers. Uh, first, Vidya Dinka, uh, direct, uh, uh, di di uh, Director Executive of INSAF India and Tony Salvador from Third World Network. Please join me on the stage, please. So maybe you can, yeah, maybe in the middle and then Tony on the far end. So we have balance, um, uh, we'll distribute uh, space on the stage. Okay, let it and go. Um, I think we will start with Vidya, who will give us the perspective on tech justice and to accelerate gender equality and more. So the floor is yours, Vidya. Let's begin with a question, okay? Because um, this is a tough fight ahead. And so we need to start questioning right now. Uh, is there any country that is for women? Any country that stands up for, stands with its women, and not just in the, in the sense of honor of women that is often, of course, just claimed by men or families, but really stands for the women, for us women. Is there any country? So if we decide that our starting block is that there is no country for women, then we know that we, it can only get better. It can only get better if we acknowledge that we are in a position where we have to mobilize, we have to understand. Uh, taxation might sound complicated to many women. Therefore, even within women's groups, within CSO networks, nobody wants to talk tax. This is a very rare room that we find ourselves in where so many have come together to listen and understand 
taxation issues and how, of course, to make um, the post-pandemic era a more accountable era. Is there any difference between the pre-pandemic and post-pandemic era for our women? Is there? Exactly. It's just exacerbated our existing problems, our existing issues. We were already gr uh, grappling with so many um, disadvantages, marginalizations, vulnerabilities. And I think post-pandemic, it's just hit us even more. More women out of jobs, more women um, dr just dropping off the planet in so many ways. While we know that in all our countries, I know for certain in mine, there are many billionaires that have been created through the pandemic whose wealth has just shot up in a kind of vulgar fashion through this whole pandemic. And yet what we see is that there's not enough questioning of this, how this can happen. How do our governments stand more with the rich, with the ultra rich? with the big corporates and not with its people, with its women, okay? So there's no country government that feels that it is answerable to its women, especially when it comes to taxation or allocation of resources. And why do they think so? Because there is no acknowledgement of women's work. Yes, it's often unpaid, uh, unpaid care work, but there's no acknowledgement of the role we play, not just within our families and our societal context, but in the economic life of our country. So the economic life of our family, our communities, our factories, and, uh, and, and everywhere, our farmlands are all dependent on women's labor. And yet we know that women are not paid enough, they do not have access to social sector services, public services as much as others. And, and, and therefore governments just forget them when they think of social sector allocation and spending. Therefore, there needs to be a reimagination, I think, and the women in, the, in this room really need to powerfully sit together and reimagine how a more gender just world can come about. And a large part of it is allocation of resources. And, and how can this happen? Right now, we know that women um, pay a disproportionate amount in taxes, even if it's indirect and, and you do not see it. And yet, because they are not acknowledged as taxpayers, as economic contributors, they, they, they don't exist in the firmament of policymakers, of politicians. Our, our um, uh, I think most South Asian countries and across the world, our whole political system of elections, even in so-called democratic countries like ours, are heavily dependent on funding, on funders, on big corporates, pushing their own agenda, and on the governments listening to the ultra-rich who, by the way, have a lot of managers, people like Tony and others, who will help them uh, to, um, and, and it's called tax avoidance now, it's not even called uh, criminal tax evasion. So how do we reimagine our own roles? And uh, how do we understand and make it understandable to other women uh, that this is theft of our labor? This is theft of money that should be spent on us for public health, for um, uh, education, for uh, a better life for our children, for um, uh, environmental. So, so also to understand that any kind of gender justice, while it is dependent on tax justice, on making taxes work for women, it needs to be positioned in um, the climate justice space. It needs to be uh, positioned in the justice for all, water for all space. And so there's an interconnectedness that we need to tap into. Um, there's also the whole 
thing about economic rights of women, and I think we do not speak of this enough. We talk of all other kinds of rights, but there is this sense of our right, our economic rights, which are basically enshrined in our constitutions. At least in India, we have um, certain duties of the state to see that wealth is not concentrated in a few hands, to see that there is a kind of parity um, and equality, there is no discrimination, etc. But it does not translate into where it is most, um, uh, most sought, which is the economic rights of all, especially of women. Uh, this is where I think we need to uh, sort of start articulating our social and economic rights um, and the rights perspective when it comes to taxation and taxation issues needs to be put um, in the center. Uh, we know that um, labor justice does not exist, whether in the house, whether it's in the informal labor markets, uh, in the access to public transportation, uh, etc. And so the, the fight um, is so big because women contribute alliance share to um, our economies, but are not acknowledged and it's very erratic piddling amounts of allocations made towards their uh, so called um, health, uh, health and uh, wealth. So um, what are we saying that 2% of value of wealth of the ultra rich is um, allocated towards not just women, but their families and everybody's well-being. And that could even mean that we could see that women are taxed less. That is one way we can talk to women saying the kinds of taxes you're paying, one, to position it before her. This is the kind of you know it. But second, that if those vulgar rich in your country are made to cough up a part of the wealth that is sitting, uh, with them uh, untaxed because your government is, you know, too cozy with them, then maybe the burden on you can be brought down. So I think we need to position this um, kind of thing that if you take from them, what is our, uh, what is it called? Is our, 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 our rightful share, our rightful share from the rich, uh, and bring it, perhaps we will have less of a burden on our shoulders because we are taking the unpaid, unpaid care work burden. We are doing the farm labor. We are doing the labor at home. Uh, if, um, if we say, oh, only my man works, I stay at home. Well, the man goes to work um, happy and healthy the next day with his iron clothes or even wash clothes only because of your work to see the economic contribution and uh, and to claim our half of the sky is what we are hoping can happen and beginning here is a journey that we hope will go towards a universal uh, international progressive uh, green feminist taxation that taxes the wealthy thank you thank you vijaya what a way inspiring and, you know, a really powerful and keep us going. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion that will follow this session. But for now, uh, we're going to Tony, who take us look to the chances of proposing legal framework for wealth tax, um, the politics of wealth tax. And so where are we uh, on a bigger picture? So Tony, the floor is yours. Hello? Okay, sorry. Maraming salamat po. <laughs> Ulit. <laughs> Again. So yeah, so uh, what struck me when I was uh, coming over to this uh, beautiful island um, is the G20 sign, no? Uh, I'm sure you, you have seen it all 
recover together, recover stronger. Uh, I think it's a very apt uh, saying right now, uh, but at the same time, there's a backdrop unto it. No, uh, There's an important thing that should be taken into consideration, which is that we need funds for recovery. We need money for recovery. It cannot just be you know, uh, a slogan, an empty slogan. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reality. In fact, even before the pandemic hit us, uh, we already need a lot of money, especially for the developing countries in terms of healthcare and in terms of education. Unfortunately, you will notice uh, in rich countries, even in rich countries and especially so in developing countries, whenever there's a need to cut budgets, it's always for some reason, they find it so easy to cut the budget of health and education. I don't know why that is. Maybe because, uh, you know, people are, you know, uh, helpless and cannot protest that much. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that's the case. Uh, so you're talking about austerity measures. Unfortunately, you have heard this a lot of times. Um, so what's, what's, why, why wealth tax? Um, is this really a radical thing? Uh, some say it's like a leftist thing or a socialist or a communist or whatever. whatever. I, I think it's not. Um, in fact, I, I saw literature as early as 1995 by no less than the International Monetary Fund speaking about wealth tax. And of course, last year there was a headline at The Guardian, uh, United Kingdom newspaper saying that perhaps according to the IMF, it's now time to impose a wealth tax, uh, at least to alleviate uh, the needs of uh, the very marginalized people in terms of healthcare and, uh, and even food subsidy and also, of course, uh, education. So uh, in the Philippines, of course, with all due respect to the other presentations, in the Philippines, uh, we see wealth tax as um, a tax imposed only on net worth. So when we speak about net uh, wealth tax, we're not speaking about estate tax. We're not speaking about additional income tax. Uh, we are not speaking about donors tax and other kinds of taxes. So uh, only on net worth. Meaning, so if you have a billion dollars in um, in assets, but you have uh, half a billion dollars in liabilities, then you have uh, half a billion dollars in net worth. No? So you, you deduct them. So you impose the wealth tax on the net worth, on the half a billion dollars. So that's our legal framework that we are trying to propose in the Philippines. Now, why wealth tax? Well, obviously, there's need for additional revenues. And unfortunately, we cannot... Uh, borrow more money. I think all of our countries are in a not so good situation in terms of debt. No, uh, some uh, worse than others, unfortunately. And wealth tax actually address the addresses the issue of uh, of uh, progressive taxation, meaning you ask for more taxes from those who can actually afford, and this will also point to us the asymmetry in the tax system at. I think in all countries. Why the asymmetry in tax system and what do I mean by asymmetry? So for example, um, a lot of times the poor are being, you know, demonized as not, as not paying taxes, as not paying income taxes, but that's not true, you know, because uh, we all pay, well, the poor especially, uh, pay value-added taxes and other consumption taxes. In fact, if you will take a look, if, if I may be a bit more technical, if you will take a look at the effective tax rates of the poor, it's much, much higher than the rich. Why? Because the poor will have to spend, if she earns $100,000, or no, one, $100, she will spend the entire $100 on food and other basic necessities. And almost all of these are taxed value added tax i was told by samira that uh, the value added tax here in indonesia is 11 percent or 10 percent, but to be increased by one percent um so in effect is if you spend a hundred dollars and all of it is taxed at uh 11 percent so, so your effective tax rate is 11 percent, right that's very high if you compare that to the billionaires how much is their effective tax rate meaning you divide the uh total amount of taxes that they had paid divided by the amount of their income. It's like 0.1% or 0%, 1% in, 
if you will remember Warren Buffett said, it's very unfair that I, he said Warren Buffett, my effective stock rate is much, much lower than my secretary. So if you, you can just see. And, and that goes even for, for employees, no? for working people. Um, our effective tax rate, our tax rates on compensation income ranges from in the Philippines 20 to 32%. That's very high. Now the uh, capital gains tax on the rich, if they sell their shares of stock or if, their share, if they sell their property, real property, it's only like 6%. So you will see the asymmetry. Um, the, uh, the wealth accumulated by the very rich does not come from compensation income. No, uh, There's no rich person who earned a lot of money by working for someone else and uh, getting income. It's always inheritance. It's always the fact that they invested well in a good company and their, the shares of stock suddenly increased. So um, now the increase in the, way, the shares of stock is not captured by income tax, right? If I buy a share in um, Amazon, for example, and it increased a million times, I do not get taxed, right? Uh, but I became richer by a million times, but I don't get uh, any tax because I, the only, the, the tax incidence will apply only if I sell that shares of stock and then I get tax for the difference. But if I don't share, if I don't sell it, then I don't get tax. So that's the idea of uh, wealth tax. Even if you do not uh, take, uh, I mean, sell of your property, be it real estate or shares of stock, then you get taxed because you just simply have too much money, way, way beyond your needs, way, way beyond the needs of your family. And if you go, we go back to the progressive tax system, then you should be the one paying taxes. This will uh, somehow address the issue of inequality, but only to a certain extent. You know, um, sometimes I, I become a bit curious or I, well, uh, not good reaction, I guess, on my part. When people say, well, uh, wealth tax is actually redistributive, no? Um, our more progressive friends say that. Actually, it's not redistributive because at the end of the day, even if you impose wealth tax that's proposed by the Philippines, you do not make the poor more economically powerful. You do not make the poor more politically powerful. They basically, they remain the same. The inverse is true. You do not make the rich less powerful and less wealthy. They continue to become extremely, extremely wealthy. At most, you have disposable money or uh, additional revenue in terms of, uh, um, well, additional revenue for the government, which the government can use for education and health. Uh, another fair question is, well, uh, wealth tax is like double taxation, right? The, the rich has already been taxed on the his or her income, and then you tax it again. Uh, actually, no, because uh, the, we are taxing the network, and the network could grow even without earning any income. In fact, even losing some income. I mean, so as mentioned earlier, or I don't know who mentioned it earlier on, um, the billionaires, no, they they increase their their net worth like ten times. Or so, for example, Jeff Bezos and. Uh, Elon Musk and other very rich people, no? during the pandemic, they increased their wealth by so much. No? And, and that does not get taxed because uh, no, it's an increase in wealth. It's not a taxable event. So that's what uh, wealth tax should be all about, taxing that, that uh, increase in wealth uh, by taxing the total uh, net worth of, any, of, um, of a person. Um, ironically, and perhaps, uh, well, um, justly, no. Uh, the wealthy will actually benefit also from the wealth tax, right? To the extent that you make rule of law more effective, to the extent that you uh, uh, make a society more peaceful, uh, to the extent that you give uh, money to the poor, which they will spend, right? Uh, you make the economy grow faster. And obviously, we all know that if an economy grows faster, it's always the rich who actually benefits first before all of us. No? So, um, so yeah, that's an additional um, uh, point for having a wealth tax. If I may just point um, maybe a, a few minutes. Um, so Argentina, for example, uh, imposed a wealth tax and they were very successful. It's a one-off uh, wealth tax 
only for the year 2021 and they said it was very very successful uh their model is also um uh, based on net worth uh as shown earlier on by irvan uh, a lot of countries are actually imposing wealth taxes so this is not nothing really radical this is not really uh something new um if i may uh, just show you the uh, our graph or our our scale or so what we did is that um yeah so if you if you can just scroll please to the uh, the scale the, the the yeah that one that one yeah this one yeah this is our uh scale of our wealth tax rates if i can just explain it for a few minutes so um under the, our wealth tax we have this uh, proposed bill it hasn't been sponsored yet at the House of Representatives, nor at the Senate of the Philippines. So uh, we're using pesos uh, here, but uh, we're starting off at uh, 300 million pesos. So that's around 6 million US dollars. So what will happen? Uh, if your net worth is only <laughs> 6 million US dollars, then you don't even have to pay um, corporate, I mean, um, wealth tax. But anything in excess of that, you will have to pay uh, wealth tax. But that doesn't mean that if you have something in excess of uh, $6 million, then all of the $6 million will be covered by wealth tax. It only means that the excess of the $6 million will be covered by wealth tax. So, Which means if you exceed by $1,000, if you have $6 million and $1,000, it's only the $1,000 that will be taxed. And if you will impose the 1.5 here, so how much is that? That's almost nothing. No? So uh, so that's that's how it, it would work. So um, if you are in, in this bracket, then um, the uh, tax that will be imposed on you would be 2.25 on that bracket. But the but of course uh, your 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 other uh, wealth will be taxed at a lower bracket and on and on and on. So this will be imposed on all persons. Uh, so it's not the case that we will classify persons. Okay, you classify uh, more than three hundred million. You classify more than uh, five hundred million. Classify more than seven hundred million. That's not the way it will work. You classify everybody as one. And then you impose these rates on the total net worth of an individual. So I just want to, to uh, show you the mechanics. And then finally, uh, we think that the wealth tax will be successful and justified politically if you show that this will be spent only on specific kinds of things. So in this case, for, for, um, for the COVID pandemic, obviously. So there in the, in the Philippine version, so we provided for four items. Uh, number one is food subsidies, especially for those who lost their livelihood during the pandemic. Number two is for, uh, for protective implements, medicines, vitamins, et cetera, et cetera, for those who are working in the hospitals. Number three, uh, vaccines, medicines, and implements for COVID-19 for everybody. And then number four, other expenditures for health, including hospital and improvement of hospital, uh, additional me medical health facilities. So this is our um, short contribution, I guess, and uh, I look very much forward to our discussion later on. Thank you. Thank, po. Yeah, thank you so much, Tony. Now we also hear really what has been progressing also in the Philippines as well. I would like to invite back joining me and joining Tony and joining Vidya here, uh, Josna and Irvan, okay, from uh, our uh, first session, join us in the panel discussion. So, please. And then, um, for those of you again who have questions or comments, please uh, note it um, in the piece of paper and pass it forward. Um, is
Okay. So of course, this is the, um, oh, <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Once again, thank you so much for all the exciting uh, presentation and sharing. We have a lot of content. We have a lot of things to digest, but also a lot of uh, issues to discuss as well. Okay, or while waiting for, you know, gathered in uh, questions or, you know, comments, uh, you can also, you know, write it down. But after this hearing the exchange, if you want to also, you know, um, uh, join in the discussion, please raise your hand, uh, briefly introduce yourself and, you know, I, I will give the opportunities. Um, but, and also people who follow online, type in your questions and then I will ask them. Okay, so... Again, let me be a little bit provocative because what I'm suspecting on hearing since the morning is that we are all on the same trajectories, on the same direction, including myself. So in order to spice, uh, have the discussion a little bit more interesting and, you know, facing the real world, because if you walk out the room or join the G20s, there will be questions of people will be, well, you can't do this. This is not possible, thing like that. And then some of the issues has been touched on already. But I kind of like want to chat. The thing is, a lot of discussion and including, I think, the thematic, you know, uh, a frame of the G20 is really recovery. And if we are looking in terms of recovery, economic growth, oftentimes tax is not in the people's mind, it's not in the policymakers. Why tax? Okay, just let, you know, the, the, the individuals or, you know, market actors, you know, perform and have the space, have the freedom to interact and generate growth. So first of all, how more taxation would you know, support growth where we all you know, is needed, especially in post pandemic world. So first, why wealth tax or tax that we have been discussing since the morning could really contribute to growth and the welfare of the poor people? in the wrong line. Who want to go first? Well, Josna, you're looking at me, maybe uh, Josna and Vidya. Okay, and then, okay, you, you all have a go, but please keep it brief, and then I hit you with another question, please. Okay, Vidya? Okay. Okay. I think uh, we need to understand that we may be in a post-pandemic world, but when it comes to wealth, I don't think we can trust that wealth only in the hands of a few will serve the common good. And I think states are duty bound to serve the common good. And therefore wealth should also be seen as commons. And therefore, I think to tax is one way of extracting wealth from where it has got concentrated and accumulated. And then to devolve it towards um, uh, social sector spending, which will actually work for women, transgenders, marginalized communities, is another whole long political struggle. But it's a struggle we must wage. And, and just like Tony was mentioning that if I hold stocks and it just goes up, what is the use? If I live in a huge mansion and I don't sell it, it's just I'm sitting on real estate, which is just growing year on year, but is totally unproductive in the larger common good. And I think we need to uh, question how we've been looking at our economic lives and question that capitalism has not worked in the interests of women, in the interests of the poor. And therefore, we need to um, reimagine, as I said. Okay, thank you. Krista? Yeah, thanks. See, uh, the thing is that even, I mean, even if you look at post-pandemic, mm. it's ironical that when, you know, the 80% of the world's population and, and definitely, say, Asia's population had suffered uh, dip in income or employment opportunities, uh, drudgery has gone up. And here you have uh, the upper 5% mm -hmm. whose income has gone up wealth has gone up and therefore there is every reason to tax that so had it been the case that their incomes had gone down very uh, 
drastically, mm -hmm. one perhaps it would have been difficult to argue for that. Mm -hmm. But in this world and democratically elected states, if they don't mm -hmm. hear, I think it's a complete violation of all principles of you know democracy. So therefore, I think we are we are on very sound grounds. Yeah. But I also think, being a researcher uh, primarily, uh, that we also have to unpack. For example, you know, Tony was saying that why is it that education and health expenditure goes down first? I think also there is there is a there is a political economy to it. If you look at uh, our countries as South Asia, but I think it's true for Asia as a whole, not necessarily other regions, is that you also there is a political economy where you have undermined uh, public systems of education and health. Mm -hmm. And so once you completely you know discredit it, the poorest also do, you know don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. So once you have discredited, it's very easy for you to withdraw. Mm -hmm. And that's what has happened. Every single country, you will find evidence for that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important for us also to question that. Mm -hmm. It's not only about, you know, we need more money. Even the poorest have started saying, oh, why do we need more money for public education? It's not giving us quality. And this is all false. You first discredit the institutions and then you withdraw. It suits you very well. Then you transfer that money. And, and give me one minute, even when you had specific uh, fiscal measures, like we call it CES, it's a very mm -hmm. British, uh, you know, uh, uh, legacy, uh, which, which is in the rank of windfall tax. So you do it for a specific purpose. In a, in a federal country like India, you don't have to share it with others. First time it was raised for war, but now it's raised on every, you know, single occasion. And union government has full control. And what has happened? Look at education says in last, say, about uh, 18 years, what has happened? It has completely replaced the uh, budgetary support for education. 75% of uh, union government's expenditure on education is funded by CES. Mm -hmm. There is a problem. You know, we are not asking for wealth tax to replace the existing mm -hmm. expenditure. Mm -hmm. So we also must argue when we are arguing for wealth tax to have that condition that it will be spent on certain okay. things and not on anything else. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Irvan, I saw that you want to take on this question as well. Simply, I will ask you a question. Uh, your question is... Uh, well, whether tax is a degrowth type of thing. Okay. The contribution of wealth, uh, wealth tax toward growth, right? Yeah. Okay. So first, we, we we can see the components of the growth. What mm -hmm. are the components of the growth? First is consumption. Mm -hmm. Second is the investments. Mm -hmm. Third is the government expenditures. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is the export minus imports. Mm -hmm. So with uh, imposing a wealth tax, first, we'll increase the state revenue. Means that the government budgets and spending will increase also mm -hmm. that's one the positive uh, mm -hmm. contribution to yeah. uh, growth mm -hmm. and the second uh, the tax uh, wealth tax revenue then distributing to the special needs for for, for example for uh, poverty alleviation mm -hmm. building a health and some and some something else and it will uh, increase the consumption of the uh, bottom uh, populations mm -hmm. so uh, simply answer your questions that's the lo uh, simple logic of the well, tax uh, impacts towards the roads. Okay, yes. thank you, uh, Tony. You want to, okay, right. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understood the question. So yeah. your question is, um, why tax? I mean, why tax? And how how does tax would encourage growth, or whether it have the adverse effect on on growth itself? Okay, so so basically, um, instead of um, just um, uh, allowing the free market to work, yeah. Uh, why tax? So first of all, um, all governments are like legal entities, also, right? So they need uh, expenses. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they need revenues. So there's this principle that uh, taxation is the lifeblood of the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, no government can function without taxes. Um, of course, th this is funny because when when I studied taxation, there's uh, the first page of the book says, um, "Okay, the government needs needs money. What can the government do? One." confiscate all of the property of the citizenry, which is not okay, right? Number two, the government can engage in business, right? Mm. For the, uh, of course, that's not also feasible. So the only feasible way is for the government to tax, to uh, raise revenues. Number two, um, 
I heard earlier on that we mentioned that tax seems to be somewhat opaque, very mysterious, only for the experts, etc., 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 which is actually totally should not be the case. Mm. Taxation concerns all of us because it is our own power. In fact, uh, obviously, you no know, um, uh, power emanates from the people, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, Obviously, we simply delegated the taxing powers to our respective parliaments, to our respective congresses, right? So it is our power. So it's not as if uh, it's only for the experts, only for the tax lawyers, only for the accountants, etc., etc. Number three, it's a policy tool. It's a tool to encourage um, certain activities. It's a tool to discourage certain activities. Um, and then uh, number four, um, Because if you tax them, they will invest less. Mm. Right? Uh, if you give them more money, they will invest. That trickle-down approach mm-hmm. to economics has been dis- disproven year in and year out and every time and each and every time. Uh, you know, uh, 2017, uh, you will remember ta- um, uh, Donald Trump um, instituted this tax reform, um, lowering the corporate income tax to, from 35 to 21, lowering the uh, capital gains tax for the rich, etc., etc., giving tax incentives and on and on. And the studies have shown that, uh, you know, rich people did not invest. Uh, the savings that they got, they simply kept it in their back accounts or spent it somewhere else. Uh, that's the same, the same thing happened in France, actually. When they removed the, the wealth tax um, earlier on, you know, the, the rich simply did not invest. So, um, so I think the wealth tax, as I mentioned earlier on, will in fact spur economic growth mm-hmm. because all of it will be spent uh, for basic needs and none of it will be flown to other countries no? okay. to invest in other countries. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you so much. I will continue. Keep, keep it brief. And then we, we just want to continue this a little bit debate is that, yes, the rich might not invest more, but they keep the money somewhere. And if you're not taxing, they're not trying to avoid, they're not trying to hide it under their bed or, you know, some secret bank account. They just put it in the national bank. And when they put it in the bank, that's where people can access and, you know, borrow and invest. But if you tax that, you know, chunk of pot of money might not be no longer available in your countries. You would have like, you know, a, a asset transfer to all the countries where you don't have, um, a, 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 you know, a, a, you know, a wealth tax. And you 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 can't control the world. You will always have these tax havens and things like that. That wouldn't that even encourage more and dry up what is needed as a resource to drive the the the, the economy. Okay, so who can take on this question? Tech, you know, uh, uh, you know, flight capital flight out of the country. Wouldn't you threaten? Uh, you know, right? Maybe Argentina did it, but but well, of course, a pandemic would come every hundred or two hundred years, and you do it one time. That's fine. That calm the you know the rich people down. But if you want to putting something year in year out, tax them every year. I heard someone saying ten percent. If you put a ten percent on real tax over a decade, they would have nothing left. Why would they stay? They would go out from the countries and go somewhere else. Tony, you want to take on this? Yeah. So. Um... Actually, each country has the responsibility to monitor everything, right? Yeah. And uh, when you impose a wealth tax, you impose the wealth tax on the net worth of per person, basically based on assets, mm. wherever the asset is located. So it's not the case that if we, if I, for example, from the Philippines, I somehow was able to place my assets in Switzerland, that doesn't mean I, I should be able to escape. Mm. I mean, the Philippine government should say, well, you still owe that that. Uh, whatever amount of money back in this case uh, located in Switzerland. So that's an administrative issue. And uh, take note, um, through the years, countries have, through tax treaties, mm. have provisions on exchange of information. So countries should should exchange information on how to administer taxes correctly. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I think, um, you know, I ended that, it's an international mm. uh, gender just and progressive feminist tax system that we need. So I, I second what Tony said. Oh, um, you know, for example, um, I mean, there have been studies that showed that cl- capital flight has 
has has not really happened at the scale that mm -hmm. the rumor mongering and the fear mongering about capital flight has been talked about. Mm -hmm. So it's not a real issue. Mm -hmm. I think we are being held at ransom mm -hmm. by the rich, by big corporates saying, oh, there will be capital flight. Mm -hmm. There will not be money available. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to take a step back and we need our governments to get real on this mm -hmm. and realize that they should not be held ransom to this kind of fear mongering. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and nowadays, the kind of assets that the rich are owning, for example, there is digital art there's artwork, there's jewelry that is just sitting there. I mean, our governments don't even know how to value them properly. How do you even value digital art or artwork mm -hmm. that more and more rich people are uh, using as their asset class? So there's a whole new um, kind of administration that needs to be put in by our governments. Mm -hmm. And yes, it needs to be international. Mm -hmm. um, and even if somebody parks their money in a tax haven yes we will get information but most of the rich own real estate mm. own homes and big bungalows mm. and that they cannot take away so tax what is in your country start somewhere let's not you know give in yeah okay thank you okay just now. it's very much possible and then the thing is that if you have evidence clearly written on mm. that things have not worked, mm. you trusted them, they yeah. didn't, they are not bringing, <laughs> you know, that would have held yeah. uh, forth if it was still in an experimental phase. Yeah. Now you have clearly there that they are not investing money, they are hoarding in various forms and newer and newer forms, mm. even under the bed. Mm. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so you have very clear evidence of that and 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 legal frames are there. So I don't think it's actually difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I also don't think that it's 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 the political class which is not aware. Mm -hmm. No, I so, so, they're not aware. So, they want to be closer to the big so, so there is a you know, so you create an impression mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, and then you get carried away by that. People mm -hmm. get carried away by that. So it's important to counter that, and I think that's that's our collective responsibility. I if okay. Yep. If you, I have one point on gender. I didn't recover. Yeah. 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 Uh, brief answer. Uh, tax evasion. Tax evasion. Yeah. Even abroad, with or without wealth tax, is inevitable, <laughs> right? So uh, the, what we need to do is the press the governments to uh, strengthen their multilateralism cooperation on taxations, mm -hmm. uh, especially on the openness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, ins for instance, about the implementation of uh, automatic exchange on information. Mm -hmm. I think it will uh, reduce the risk of the capital flight mm. from the uh, wealth tax implementations. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. May I, I just just to to let people who are listening in not, not to get too nervous. I, we have only to follow up, not follow up, and another two questions to to you know. Um, uh, add, I have heard you know the discussion on this issue before. Uh, another one would be on the issues of fairness. Well, you might be strange fairness for, for the billionaire. This is something, but I, go, I get one there. And on another issue is the effectiveness or the efficiencies on the fairness. Um, Tony mentioned, uh, uh, touch on the issues of double taxation. Uh, many people touch on the issues that, you know, well, this is, is almost seem criminalized or illegal that how people get that rich. But the thing is, why not aiming of if they are not getting rich legally or the way that it should be, let tax at that source, right? For example, many people agree with, you know, capital gain tax or windfall tax, or, you know, really aggressive, progressive income tax. But if you tax and, and, and even corporate tax, but if this has been all taxed properly already, and if people make a wise investment, successful investment, taking risk and being successful, why you are going to be, you're going to penalize them for doing just that, okay? On this, I saw Tony <laughs> shaking his head. So I'm going to you. Should the focus be on all the form of taxation rather than the end result of tacking the the well, why people being success in doing their business? 
um, so for example, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, Jeff Bezos and yeah. Elon Musk, right? Uh, they have, uh, let's say, 10 billion worth of um, shares of stock in Amazon or Tesla, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But because of the pandemic, their shares of uh, shares of stock, the value increased from uh, 10 billion US dollars to let's say 100 billion US mm-hmm. dollars. That's what is called a non-taxable event. So because you they, get, they are not selling it, right? Yeah, yeah. You're not selling it, uh-huh. so it's a non-taxable event. In the meantime, you become very extreme, <laughs> extremely rich. But it's only so on your paper. Because if you're not selling yeah, it. Yeah, but but at the same time, your ability to earn more money, your ability to to get yeah, loans out it, of that, yeah, your ability to mortgage it, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. increases. And, yeah. the, the, and, and, and the reality is the value of the shares of stock usually does, does not go down, right? More so, for example, uh, property, like right? mm-hmm. real estate. In the Philippines, it's almost never the case that the real estate goes down. In the U.S., we hear that, right? Mm. Uh, the mortgage value, etc., mm. etc. But in the Philippines, you know, it just keeps on increasing. I mean, every minute, literally. So you you must be able to tax that amount because otherwise, uh, you deprive the government and the people of much needed cash. Okay. Thank you. Does mean even though uh, you are not making sure money of it, but that asset really create more opportunities for example as it could be get collateral for you to get you, you need it. okay okay thank you really clear okay uh, so i would come to my last question on this section is that the issues of you know because you have taxation is on the income side of the government and we all agree that the government hasn't have enough but on the spending side a lot of people were saying anything or you know the high net worth probably would say that Yes, I'm willing to, you know, contribute more if I'm confident that the government would spend it wisely. Of course, the proposal would say, okay, only spend it on healthcare, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, providing vitamins for health workers and things like that. Yeah, but if you do that, government will save money somewhere else and might decide to buy more military aircraft, uh, you know, getting, you know, marching somewhere, even nuclear submarine. So, why not really spend making sure that the, the spending is right before you know starting on you know getting you know uh, taxing people okay on these issues so i have already said that yeah. we have to have a condition and i think the root lies in in democracies mm. uh, working through parliament and 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 other means legislative means and putting that condition mm. like we have very clear evidence of uh, you know, raising revenues on some name and then spending there, but then withdrawing the other revenue, the mm. core support. So, so to prevent that, you have to have those uh, markers. Mm. So it's it's very much uh, there. Um, one more thing I want to, and that's <laughs> provocative too, that you know, uh, one has to keep, especially those who are in the realm of activism, mm. the the deeper changes into mind. See, for example, and this time bringing the gender issue this whole issue of care economy. Now, governments are actually slowly going to lap it up because it helps to show a higher GDP. Mm. So if there is the care economy contribution, their GDP is go up. up. So India will be very happy you know, to show that, oh, GDP is t- not two times, but five times more than Pakistan. So it will love to do that. But it doesn't make any real change in women's life. And therefore, I feel that you know certain things on gender count. If we are advocating, we should also go beyond domesticity. It's not only about monetizing care economy, but breaking domesticity of women is is as critical. And and some of our tax policies, expenditure policies, mm. in in a country like, again like India, we have declining uh, uh, women's workforce participation. Mm. That's completely uh, you know in contrary to trends everywhere. Mm. else yeah. even within South Asia so it's important that when we talk of change we also are aware of again uh, these shifts and do not kind of uh, celebrate mm. minor changes which may not leave, yeah. lead to any difference in lives thank you thank you Vidya yeah if I may add uh, is it working now yeah yeah, it is. Okay. So um, if I may add to that, see, um, 
in India, for, for example, post pandemic, the amount of women in the workforce have gone down drastically. Uh, even in the informal sector, we are seeing that they have had to stay home more to take care of things at home or for other reasons. Another thing is that social spending um, for access, um, which is important to women, like women access public services and are dependent on public services far more than men, on public transport, on other things. They don't own their own vehicle. They will go by bus, by train, etc. And if you're not putting women in the center of your planning um, and your allocations of social sector spending, then you will not spend on the things that matter. You will get a shiny new metro from here to there with IFI money, et cetera, but you will not put in more buses on the routes where women are going to garment factories, where women are going to different kinds of work, which will bring them that economic independence. So I think it's a long political battle. We cannot step away from the fact that we need to mobilize, we need to agitate, we need to educate. And, um, and, and this is a long haul battle. So I think taxing the wealthy is a very, um, taxing the rich uh, is something that will appeal to everyone. It is, a, that is like from a go, you will have a lot of people who are invested with you and agree with you. And even there are billionaires who now agree that they must actually, you know, and there are some billionaires who acknowledge that they should be actually so scared of not paying a wealth tax because there can be a real pushback from the common people. So I think there are gradations of, of how the wealthy are looking at it, but I think the time is ripe for pushing on all fronts on a wealth tax and we can get somewhere. Okay, everyone, thank you. Yeah, as a nation state, the governments uh, play a role as the administrator. That's why the Barack Obama never say, in my government, he always said, in my administrations. So the government function first, ultimately, is to uh, make sure that the people interest, national interest, is uh, accommodated. In the regards to the wealth tax, uh, to make sure that this uh, wealth tax revenue uh, distributed accur uh, accurately to the uh, needs. Uh, first, government needs to uh, recognize this wealth tax is coming from the wealth tax payer. For instance, uh, uh, wealth tax for school. Well, tax for sure. So when the tax revenue from the wealth tax is uh, distributed for the uh, building a new school, we can see that like a basketball hall, named, yeah, namely with the wealth tax payer as a recognition, for instance, because why the, the high net worth individual or the rich people also needs a recognition. That's why the they built, for instance, like a philanthropist uh, family organizations to, to, uh, to, what, to what, uh, what the purpose of this. So they want to show to the people that uh, we are a part of the community of the people. So uh, uh, the, the, the task of the government is to manage this uh, what uh, emotion or a symbol, right? So, and also the wealth tax uh, will be elevating solidarity among the uh, class mm -hmm. of the people, mm -hmm. I think. So it will uh, strengthen the unity of the, yeah. the people, I think. Yeah. Okay. So if, if I'm hearing correctly is that, you know, wealth tax is not, you know, is, is not the end goal in itself, but then how you administered it and how where it's being spent and how, pe how transparency, the level of transparency is participation and decision making of people in the in in this you know allocation is critical, and I hear from Jonathan as well because democratic values and system should be accompanied when we are talking about such issues. Okay, so this is I think this is one of the key points that I get from from the discussion so far also, and then and also what Vidya mentioned is that you know we are not we and oftentimes you know people it, it well almost none of us are billionaire you know it's very really rare to find billionaire. If I'm uh, reading the report correctly, 
in Indonesia, you're talking about 4,000 plus. You, know, you mentioned 4,700. Uh, well, it will be difficult in your lifetime that you find the 4,700 out of the 200 million population. And in India, from, from SAPE report, um, only like uh, 68,000 you know, persons out of a billion of population. And yeah, and then tax, and then the, 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 the amount of wealth would equal to almost, you know, uh, the majority of healthcare, you know, spending for the whole countries or 17 years of, you know, uh, 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 provide lunch for poor children, uh, students for 17 years, for every day for 17 years. So this is huge, as you mentioned, as the contribution or from a, such a small amount of population is, is not even decreasing the total wealth or the ability to create even more wealth because you are talking about really a small percentage. So it's the issues of contributions there. And when, what I want to go on that, so, okay, where are we at the moment? I, I, you know, I hear you when you mentioned that is uh, uh, in, in you, you have been discussing with even interviewing high net worth individual in Indonesia, talking with policymakers, parliamentarians in, in the Philippines, it's been... Um, uh, on now starting progress in, 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 into the Congress already, into the, you know, the, the, the House already. So can you just come back a little bit and share with us where exactly is the, uh, the, 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 the consideration of wealth tax in Indonesia? And because a lot of people who are listening to us might say, okay, this is like a dream thing for, you know, NGO, civil society. But I think at this conjuncture, is, is not that far. It's really something that have a real progress that have been happening. So if uh, Irvin, can you touch a little bit on, you know, where, where are you? For, for where we are, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult question, but I'll try to answer. But uh, I would like to uh, sh share information so, uh, that I missed on the presentations that besides the government's uh, opinions, uh, majority favoring the wealth tax ideas, also, the billionaires of humanity uh, before uh, in the 2021 uh, uh, conducted survey uh, with the 1,400 respondents. And then the respondents' backgrounds are the uh, political party constituents. And then the result of the res uh, this survey is 69% uh, of the respondents agree. Yeah, agree to the wealth tax. Yeah. 69%. And then we made a, a not survey, like a structured uh, interviews with the 61 uh, governments, uh, sorry, 61 member of parliaments. And then, as, as I said before, the result is uh, more than 70% of them preferred for the wealth tax. That's a, it's only a, a, need a little like a social uh, push or a negotiation or a lobby to make. Uh, to assure them that the people will accept this. And uh, there is a possibility that the high network individual will uh, accept this also. Yeah, so we, 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 need, uh, we need to make our uh, representatives more confident like, to, to implement it. Yeah, I think. Okay, probably... thank you. Um, any, do you want to touch on this? Uh, okay. yep. Yeah. So in the Philippines, there's already a bill passed uh, mm. in Congress, lower house, actually House of Representatives, but we have our own bill. So hopefully if uh, a Congress person sponsors our bill, then there will be two bills. The process in the Philippines is that you have uh, committee hearings at the Committee on uh, Ways and Means Committees, mm. and then they try to, Much. you know, uh, somehow merge uh, the two. Uh, and hopefully... Um, the, the problem, though, is unlike in Indonesia, there's no political support on the part of uh, legislators in mm. the Philippines. In fact, we presented to a very progressive senator, but uh, she said that uh, she's having a difficult time, uh, you know, um, um, justifying it to her constituents and to her technical people. So as you implied uh, earlier on, um, they made a couple of proposals for alternative sources of revenue, but not certainly that uh, uh, wealth tax. Uh, and then the Department of Trade or the Ministry of Trade said that, um, you know, there's going to be capital flight if we do that. So, but of course we know that that's not the case. Yeah, when we just discussed about that. And also, um, if I understand correctly, the, 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 the research from SAPE also touched on the very point of, you know, uh, uh, the, the situation in South Asia. And so here, okay. Oh, so here, uh, okay. The, 
because in the past, I remember when you know I used to work on issues related to IMF and World Bank and the IMF conditionalities, going back to Asian financial crisis. Very rare that we see recommendation regarding taxation. Uh, we normally see, you know, um, uh, cut public spending, authorities, you know, uh, uh, put more opportunity for business. But then recently, um, uh, 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 in the situation in Sri Lanka, um, uh, in, in Pakistan, and so on, what has been the, the, uh, the recommendation in relation to these issues um, uh, on, you know, on taxation uh, for, for the countries? I, if I understand correctly, is it something that you know um, the the I'm, uh, I'm, uh, IFIs are also you know uh, be more open mind on the issues or recommendation regarding wealth taxation? Any Mike Mike is around there? Can we hear from? And then if I also um, uh, our colleagues from Pakistan can can share you know after hearing from Suhir as well. Thank you. Yes, the. Yes, the international financial institutions uh, are on board with the concept of that wealth taxation is to be introduced, especially after the pandemic. Uh, maybe like they feel like they have to save this system from crashing, to save the capitalism from crashing. So this may be a rescue tool. However, uh, this um, the uh, they. Uh, for Sri Lanka, like Jyotsna has said, like uh, the talk is on with the IMF and IMF has put this as one of the conditions uh, for the bailout or the rescue package, rescue packages. So uh, in that regards, yes, they are on board and even the United Nations uh, has even uh, talked of like having a forming a UN, having the need for a UN convention and all this. However, it needs to be uh, tailored towards the need of the developing nations, towards the need of the crisis-ridden countries, and how the proposal would turn out, uh, that should be the main issue. Because like uh, it has been highlighted uh, by the panelists that simply uh, raising revenues is not, the, is not only the issue. Like Josna said about how the public institutions are discredited and through the, uh, the process of discrediting them, the other uh, sides, the demand side, the people have themselves started saying that, okay, public issues are bad, now let's go for private. And then the state begins to withdraw from them. So this side is also important, how the political economy of uh, this, uh, the, the entire region has been working uh, against uh, public welfare. And hence, uh, we need to be very wary of how the proposals would turn out. So more on Pakistan's issue, I think yes. our friend from Pakistan, Aisha Ahmed, would say. Yes, thank you, this. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right. So um, we've had these detailed uh, comments and uh, I mean, I don't really need to add a lot on that, but from the Pakistan context, uh, it's not just post pandemic. It's uh, Pakistan is most vulnerable in South Asia regarding the climatic calamity. So these recent floods have totally devastated our economy. And um, uh, there is this UN report that says that 800,000 farm animals have uh, perished. Then there are these, um, uh, two million acres of crops that uh, uh, that that are totally devastated, and women workforce, uh, the the labor force, it's is uh, is estimated to be forty percent that is connected with agriculture. So it's again going to have this uh, negative impact on the labor force alongside the uh, women participation in that context. So uh, post word post uh, flood. Uh, uh, adverse effect on tax is going to be on on the agriculture. And um, again, I would like to comment on the super tax that we uh, had a uh, discussion on earlier. Uh, the 
it's it's it sounds promising 10 percent and then there are these 13 big sectors on which it's going to be implemented but again the question is that who are the ones who are going to get it implemented because in our uh, part of uh, south asia in our parliament it is these uh, there are these representatives of these sectors that are sitting in the parliament and then uh, we have the history of military and uh, military again is not pro um, gender just tax military is in favor of uh, these tax uh, policies because they're investing in real estate military is the biggest real estate investor these days and uh, it's either directly controlling the economy or indirectly via the politicians so we have more challenges when we talk about pakistan tax collection is is a bigger challenge uh, if i compare it with the neighboring countries these are the things that that i wanted to point out the the floods the conditions after the floods and um, our real estate boom and since we don't have a tax on the real estate and um, uh, this is a problem that we that we see and though it sounds promising we don't expect it to happen because the ones that are going to get it are the ones that are ultimately being benefited from. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, the, 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 the information situation from Pakistan. Now, uh, I think it's the time that we open the floor for questions and comments. So please, uh, you know, we have the mic there. Uh, briefly introduce yourself and uh, you know if you want to direct your question to us any particular speakers please uh, identify yes. that hello hello it's yes okay. uh firstly introduce myself that my name is david sento and i'm from the university of udayana uh first of all i want to thank you about all the information that you give to us about the wealth tax here so my question is uh how will the public interest be look like according to the operation of the wealth tax? Because even though the, the progress of the financial and the planning here, but there are some public interest will be thinking like uh, some government in not, not to mention like in some places, not to mention Indonesia here, uh, there's still a high corruption rate. Like even, even in 2021, there's at least like, hold on, uh, yeah, at least, 371 cases in total of 2.3 trillion rupiah that's lost in which will kind of like the, the the public interest will think like uh taxing is something like people the is like something not going to be useful and that the government is going to be using the money for for their only needs like it's not going to develop even the private company itself is most sometimes it's going to be trusted more than the government itself so like uh, how will how will the public relations dealing this on on the whole thing like this like there's the wealth tax is planet and um <clears throat> sorry uh like how how will you think about the the public relation in it like that thank you thank you i think it's also it's linked to the, the issues of you know the trust in the government in the in the administration whether it, yeah yes yes yeah okay and the issues of corruption i think we touched a little bit on that already but i think if you, if you want to respond to that yeah okay yes. i think the phenomena that we have seen till now is that the rich do not actually um act as a pressure group on behalf of others but only on behalf of themselves right it's the rich and privileged who go close to government for more for the corporate sector or for themselves if you have a wealth tax where their money is put into the public kitty and anyway the money is there with the government then then maybe we can make allies of the rich billionaires so that they also ensure that that money is deployed in the right places for the right things so that they don't have to talk of corporate social responsibility schemes and stuff like that, or even charity. A lot of our countries have big billionaires who do charitable works, etc. 
this is their rightful share, which is to be collected by government in the form of taxes. It should be deployed for the common good from the rich to the rest. I think here is an opportunity. We know we have several problems. We know we have corrupt governments and institutions. But here is an opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm a social activist and a street fighter first. So I always look at things as an opportunity for a campaign, for getting more people on board. And imagine how much more powerful that campaign will be if the rich are with us advocating for the right things. That okay. Just now? Yeah. On the issue, on the issue of corruption, uh, you know, there is corruption. But it's not that it's localized also only within public administration. You know, corruption is there everywhere, even in the sphere of private. And if you look at, very surprisingly, if you look at uh, uh, correlations, what you find that despite corruption, higher public expenditure uh, uh, in certain areas like health and education actually is very well correlated, very highly correlated with better indicators in education and health and distribution of wealth. So despite corruption, public expenditure manages to do that, you know, and that's true for all over the world. It's not only, uh, you know, South Asia or Asia, it's true for all over the world. And therefore, I think corruption is, is, is again, is a ploy and that needs to be countered rather than bought into. So that is one. Second is this that, you know, uh, I think one argument that I keep making, look at the entire Europe, you know, it's capitalist. It's not a socialist euro. And still, the notion of democratic welfare state has made them, the capitalism has thrived because of massive public expenditure on health, education, and uh, social protection. And so, so, you know, one can argue these uh, uh, so that that becomes important. One point on international financial mm -hmm. institutions that it should not be, you know, what they are doing is, as a, it's a rescue mechanism. Mm. And I think that needs to be countered. That, you know, wealth tax should not be seen as a rescue mechanism. Mm. You know, so once you, and that, that gives them power. So once you are on the brink of collapse, here do I come as a savior, and then I'm uh, promoting pro poor policy. I think that needs to be countered by our community. Mm. That, you know, we, we don't need to reach there. You know, it should be deployed much before that. We need not, you know, allow our economy to collapse. To, uh, Thank I you. would like to just add on to the IFI point I wanted to. See, IFI's, uh, their worldview is pretty much the traditional worldview um, of how economies and infrastructure development should function, should play out in um, Asian countries. So uh, they are not doing anything radical. And of course, I agree with Tony that wealth tax is not a radical idea. It has been there in various forms since eternity. Uh, but I don't think we can trust them to be good allies in the fight for wealth tax. Um, I think we must understand that they push for privatization and financialization of public services, and it makes it tougher for the marginalized, the poor, uh, for women and other groups to access these uh, public services. So I think IFIs must be made to comply with citizens' um, worldviews and not that we go along with what the IFIs are telling us. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I'll try to answer a uh, question from the David. Right? I think... Uh, it's quite uh, it's quite difficult to because about the how to government the, uh, tackle the public distrust, all right? Because it's about the public interest. Uh, I think uh, the government shall establish a real good governance practice. We know that the good governance has uh, four uh, consists of four uh, principles at least: transparency and uh, a participation, accountability, and collaborations. So if in any decision-making process, the government opens for the CSO, for instance, uh, the, the, the participations of or the budgeting or uh, planning the program and also 
uh, open the room for the public for participation, public hearing, etc. I think this process, this process will reduce the risk of the corruptions. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in all the questions, okay, on this side and then here, okay. So we're going there first. Uh, 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 the mic, where's the mic? Okay. Oh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dwi Ariani. I'm the regional head of program for Disability Rights Fund and Disability Rights Advocacy Fund for Asia. Uh, my question is, uh, is there any best practice that you can share from your research in, in, in the countries where WellTax actually provided support for women with disability for their empowerment? Because when we're talking about women with disability, we know they are part of, they are a woman, but they are also person with disabilities have multi-discrimination. So I wonder if you can share with us how that... Uh, Example of country using their wealth tax to support empowerment of women with disabilities. And my second question is for colleague from, if any colleague, I, I don't remember if there is colleague from Sri Lanka or done a research in Sri Lanka. No, okay. So just wondering what is the situation now for person with disability in those country because of the impact of this uh, COVID-19 economic impact because we are now understand that person with disability living in poverty so how this impact them and how well tax can actually in the future be a solution for this kind of crisis thank you thank you thank you for the questions um one one terima kasih ibu dwi thank you ibu dwi for the uh, questions best practice about the uh, well text implementation and it's uh, how it's benefiting women and uh, persons with the disability to be honest that uh, I, I haven't read about the specifically this issue about the relations or connections between the well text and also the uh, it's it benefits for the uh, persons and uh, to do with, uh, and persons with the disabilities in uh, certain countries, but uh, what I would like to emphasize that this wealth tax will gain the opportunity for the persons with the disability and women to what to uh, to capture more opportunity. For instance, for uh, for persons with disability, the, the, the tax revenue from the wealth tax can be distributed to build uh, what uh, vocational and of training uh, center for, like 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 uh, for such, such that and also for a woman that well text can also uh, for can be uh, distributed for the unpaid care work for instance and uh, i'm sorry that i couldn't uh, answer your questions of order because i don't have a capacity to answer uh, uh, that questions thank you but just uh, thank you want to yeah Um, uh, disabilities, I don't have clear examples, and it's also difficult to link. See, taxation is not necessarily linked with expenditure. You know, by definition, it's not, and therefore it becomes difficult. You have examples of uh, better policies on including disabilities, and I'm sure you know they are the last to be included, and therefore they would be first to be excluded. I'm sure in Sri Lanka that would be the case. In anywhere in the world that would be the case. One example that came to me uh, in 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 the form of uh, say women's uh, rights, you know, protecting their rights is property tax. That in most countries, including uh, India, it's at the level of local government, and uh, uh, some of and then they, therefore it varies from place to place. So the entire country does not have the same policy and some uh, uh, in certain places they have the policy of some relaxation the lower tax rates and those kinds for women similarly for even uh, land uh, uh, stamp duties and all and uh, a very personal example you know i i was in a flat for 
uh, for a very brief period in in a city in an indian city and the lady opposite me one night came out knocking at the door saying that my husband is beating me very highly educated she was a chartered accountant in dubai before moving back to india and uh, and the police was there and uh, mm, so police actually anyway so to cut the long story short when the police guys were leaving with her husband uh, because she insisted that i won't spend the night with him she had a teenage daughter with her um, they made a comment saying uh, telling her husband that the biggest uh, uh, mistake you have made is to have the joint property you know property on joint name to save some taxes okay <laughs> and and he i mean they left and i asked the woman and she said well it's not that he has done a favor it was my money which which we have bought but the point is that the fact that it was a joint property even for the purpose of saving taxes you know it's not you know i really don't want to share it with my spouse but i'm doing it to save taxes even then it worked as a protection for her so even when you are doing it not for the real change you are doing it because the law gives you a few more pennies if you go for that it does act as protection so therefore the law comes therefore the system comes therefore the fiscal policy is acting as 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 one of the ways of at least few steps of change could play a role thank you joseph um i think netra Uh, th thank you. Uh, I am Netra Timshina uh, from South Asia Alliance for Poverty Eradication, Sape from Kathmandu. Uh, the, uh, um, I have uh, some observations, some comments uh, on the discussion that uh, is happening uh, this morning. Uh, we are talking, we, we are discussing about the bigger political issue. Taxation sometimes seems to be have uh, some illusion that it is the technical one or like that. In somehow it is the technical one as well, but it is the larger political and then policy issue. So we need to be mindful on that. It is a bigger and we need a bigger engagement to make changes in terms of the progressive taxations and then wealth taxations, allocations, etc. And it is the nasty states, the government, has the ultimate authority to change the policy, the policy and then political economy. And then also we have to be mindful that as we are talking about the um, Sudhir presented Bretton Woods institutions, okay, IFIs, they are also appears to be somehow positive the wealth tax and other, other progressive taxation because of the crisis. So all the nation states, the governments are also controlled by all these the financial institution for example we are mm, talking this whole the taxations debate at a times that still there is the de deregulation imposed by Bretton Woods uh, institutions and then subscribed by most of the uh, countries in the world and then another there is a free market floating only the deregulation and market is crisis because they are not making much profit because of the this all the what is pandemic and then climate crisis so we need to see the our campaign and our recommendation in a context that i wanted to make you know one observation another one is that there is a still strong counter uh, narratives that comes from that the wealth tax may distort the economic growth though we have made our argument in our report in our presentations then how we can fight with that, the counter narratives, counter discourse. There is the one still issue we need to uh, take to consideration. Another is that there is, I already said that our strategy need to uh, have more and more engagement with the government agencies, either they be federal, either they be local, either they be the, uh, the national government. Because even the local government in Nepal, we have a three tires. Uh, government and then local government is the independent they can raise the tax even we can start at the different level and we can make a larger uh, changes and then the last one is that since we are organizing this 
uh, event uh, in relation to the G20. Okay, no, not only as a Sape or Prakasa, but what will our demand as a uh, C20 actors? Okay, in this room with the G20, at least one or two or three. Why? Why we are organizing? What is the rationals behind this? That that we need to have this the G20. Thank you. Thank you, Netra. And then you know you're really helping me because that's where the point on the G20 is. I want to come in to close off. But before we we because we oh we are arriving at 12 p.m. already. But may I see any are there other um, questions or comments that you want to make? Okay, one. And may, may I see all the hands just, just to make sure. If not after that, you know, you can come and talk directly to the speakers, you know, uh, uh, after the session. But I would open the opportunity for one, one last question. Please briefly introduce yourself. And yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Julie and I'm uh, representing Puspadi Bali, a center of empowerment for persons with disabilities in Bali and also Eastern Indonesia. Uh, thank you very much for um, the presentation today. Um, uh, this is actually new for me that I just uh, find out that uh, we can actually tax the rich people because I uh, all along the way, I think they're just paying the tax just the way we are. Um, I'm also glad to hear that uh, that some billionaires are actually acknowledging this and that if not, they worry of a major pushback from the community and that taxing is... Taxing the rich is an appeal to everyone. Uh, my next thing is, uh, it, it's, it's, it can be a question and also a statement because some uh, rich people in Indonesia or, in, uh, or abroad, they also have their, their own foundation for social charities. Like in Indonesia, uh, PT Jarum has Jarum Foundation. Uh, Mr. Bakri and family has Bakri Foundation. Melinda and Bill has their own foundation as well. Is is there a way that uh, we can push uh, these foundation to be more uh, mainstreaming uh, to reduce inequalities by um, mainstreaming uh, the 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 focus of their foundation into uh uh helping more uh, vulnerable people especially women and also person with disabilities thank you thank you very much um because since we are arriving at a uh, time already what i would like to ask is that i will go one round for people to you know provide your final comments respond to the question and the statement and also if you wish Make reference to the G20s. We are tomorrow. We have, you know, our, our already today's uh, head of state are coming to this beautiful island. Uh, they're going to meet. What is the relevance of G20 in relation to these issues? Okay. Uh, are there way? Are there consideration? Uh, are there proposal that has been made, uh, especially in relation to the C20 as well? So on this, on the G20s. Uh, uh, on uh, and, and then the, respond to the, the questions and then, you know, your final remarks. Maybe I can, can start from Irvan and then go to Tony. Yep. So, uh, I think we can uh, propose to the G20 the, some idea that the wealth tax is a way, an instrument uh, to uh, alleviate the poverty with the uh as an alternative way yeah. so because why because the g20 uh leaders or the countries uh they, they try or most of the countries try to alleviate the poverty with a bis business as usual way for stance like a cash transfer mm -hmm. yeah cash transfer so yes it is yeah it is uh, one dimension uh of the problem solving or to reducing uh, poverty, but we need uh, another dimensions mm -hmm. to uh, what uh, to reduce poverty and also on uh, narrowing the uh, inequality gap. 
Yeah. And also, it is also uh, related to the uh, what uh, Business 20 uh, agenda that they want to do more uh, for the sustainable world and etc etc and as we know that the sustainability concept uh, also considering the uh, social uh, and beside of the environment and governance so uh, how they do to uh, social context of the sustainability sustainable developments the wealth tax can be a, an alternative to achieve that uh, what's to achieve that uh, targets yeah and uh, how to push foundations to uh, to support uh, this idea? I think we have to uh, educate uh, each other and also socialize these ideas. Uh, and again, that this is not only the this is the public interest. Yeah, this is the public interest because uh, transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor uh, through the tax instruments. It's it's. Uh, it's a, a normal it's a right it's, i think it's i mean it's a right for the for for the poor to get a, a little bit from the rich because uh why because that's the function of the uh what uh government yeah that's that's how that's why government uh i mean uh that's uh, the function of the government how to make sure every single people to uh to what uh to make a social justice, for instance, yeah, that's why uh, Adam Sweet uh, write book with the, uh, entitled "Wealth of Nation." So, uh, wealth of nation is the wealth accumulation of all people and shall to be enjoyed by all the people who live there. Also, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, yeah, again, the um, um, slogan of uh, G20, no? um, recover together, recover stronger. Um, we'll need a lot of funds uh, to do this. Um, incidentally, no, it's the G20 and the OECD who is pushing for the what's called, the, they want to address the issue of um, taxation of the digital economy. Um, they see the unfairness of uh, the big digital platforms getting away of, with not paying taxes in countries like Indonesia, India, et cetera, et cetera, because they're not physically present. So, yeah, so we should throw it to them. Okay, that's good. You're trying to address that. We have disagreements with you with respect to how you do it, but uh, at least you're addressing the fact and you're recognizing the fact that there's a problem. There's a huge problem. So maybe you can also recognize the fact that there's a huge problem in terms of uh, uh, wealth tax, in terms of... Uh, the inability of governments to tax the very, very rich people. Um, so yeah, so apart, aside from the uh, BEPS framework, uh, base erosion and profit shifting, maybe they should also address the wealth tax issue. I just want to uh, mention something about the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates and the other foundations. No? Unfortunately, of course, they're doing good things in their own ways, but uh, unfortunately, these rich people have a very different framework in terms of uh, working with governments for them um you know keep our we will keep our money we'll use it to to help the poor and save the world <laughs> so uh, don't take the money from us uh but it makes you wonder how much should they be able to pay or would how much would they pay in case we have wealth tax and how much do they spend in terms of uh, uh their foundations and, and what have you know uh, of course, uh, the foundations uh, are, you know, the contributions are tax deductible. No? Uh, so, uh, of course, there's, it's only tax deductible. It's not as if uh, it's tax credit. But uh, uh, at the same time, there's really a very different worldview. Uh, they want to make governments uh, as far as possible or hands off with respect to business, what, which is what you intimated, uh, intimated to earlier. But, uh, it's totally different. Thank you. So, uh, you know, so taking forward from him to start with that three points I would like to make. So one is about this, you know, the foundations. Uh, I mean, they have their right. Some are good foundations, some are bad and good and bad is relative. You know, I consider something good. She may consider it bad. So good when I say so it has. But the in the end, 
when we are talking of government spending, that's my right. I can't go and ask Bill and Melinda Gates to ensure that my children get proper education. I can go to my, uh, you know, parliament and my uh, democratically elected government to ensure that my children get good education. I get good health care. So it's also a question of right. Why should I accept charity? I have my rights. I'm a citizen of a country. I, you know, I pay my taxes and I must get my due rights. So I think that's a major difference. And that's, that's a big difference. And that's something we need to be careful about rather than being dependent on these international, you know, charity or, or national charity within of rich people, then making them uh, do what they should be doing, contributing to public money. So that's, that's one. Second is, uh, mm, uh, before coming to G20, the third tier that uh, Netra was mentioning, I think that's a very important thing. Uh, in, in many uh, South Asian countries, actually, third tier government and including big and small is responsible for a number of taxes which are linked with pop property and other kinds. So property tax, for example, is in the hands of local government because we largely follow the same model. So, and I, I think it's important and many, many local governments actually don't do anything about it. So I think campaign for, for grassroots organizations there will be a key uh, thing if, if you know you all who are in that business of advocacy. And uh, one thing I was discussing actually yesterday and uh, have written about it is in real estate investment by not so rich also, you know, even the rich middle class and vacant housing is, is a very common thing. And I actually think, you know, and that's a kind of wealth tax that you are talking of. So there are many ways of wealth taxation and one should try to map and, and work on that. G20, I think one should ask, one should have, I mean, that's a strategic recession. This is your way to get out of recession. You trusted rich people, they will not, even the super rich is not going to invest when they see the recession coming. They will invest elsewhere. They will keep money under the bed or somewhere else, they will not invest because they don't see it growing in, in immediate future because of the recession, fear of recession. If you have to come out, you have to spend, how do you spend it? Give it in, in the hands of those who won't save it, who will spend. Have a, that's, that's where you know I'm, I'm saying go for a different model. So if you want to get out of recession, this has to be your model. Don't trust them, they have failed you. Transfer it. And once it happens, it will benefit them as well. You know, if, if we manage to pull it out of recession, it's going to help you. And, and developed countries, the G20, which is largely the developed countries congregation, they, they are far more scared and uh, uh, of recession than poorer countries. And therefore, I think that should be the argument. Thank you, Shwasna. Vitya? Um, so, uh... There's a dual responsibility. As I said before, the state is duty bound towards its citizens. To, um, you know, what? Thank you. So the state is duty bound um, and one way of ensuring that it does its duty towards its citizens is through taxation that makes money available for these kinds of acts. In, in India, we have this whole um, idea that the rich or even corporations hold wealth as custodians for the rest of society. You know, so this is, um, I think Mahatma Gandhi was a great advocate of, yeah, of this uh, whole idea of trusteeship or being in custody of wealth on behalf of all others. And therefore, I think um, even who, um, uh, you know, you, ma'am, who spoke up about those foundations, I agree completely with Jyotsna. Uh, it's a question not of charity, not of philanthropy. It's a question of responsibility. And I think they need to be reminded. So one 
is the responsibility and accountability of the government to its people, is the uh, responsibility of big um, corporations and rich individuals and families towards the rest of society, and, and which brings us to the G20 leadership. I think the G20 leadership more than anyone else is responsible to, um, you know, to wipe every tear from every eye as one of our um, um, uh, great leaders had also said. And therefore, I think what we expect from the G20 leadership here um, is to really rethink if they want to be uh, democratic ideals um, and uh, you know icons of democracy, then they need to veer a little less towards the very rich and veer more towards those who vote for them uh, and vote them into power. And uh, they need to do much more. Uh, for this, we have advocated for a UN tax body, an international system of taxation, which is reflected within our countries, uh, that is not just um, gender just and responsive, but also, um, you know, furthers climate justice, furthers uh, labor justice, education rights, health justice, and a whole myriad infrastructure also can be just and accessible to all. So I think we, we need to see that this agenda is taken forward, not just from the C20 presidency onto the Indian and the Brazilian presidency. It's going to be a long haul fight. The Indian C20 is already something that seems very much in the in the clutches of the government, of the present government, and we don't know how critical they will be. But we from civil society in India, whether we are part of the official C20 or as a pressure group outside, promise to be a people's C20, a people's civil society, which will take the people's voice and demands to the leadership um, to see that there will be a change uh, for a just, equitable world. Thank you. And be, before moving further, uh, just want to check with our C20 co-share of this year. These issues of wealth tax is also in the in, in the communication between the C20s to the G20s already. So it's, it's, it's not us only making a verbal requests or not requests, a proposal here is, is they have something to respond to the people and, you know, a message to uh, media colleagues uh, if you want to, you know. Uh, yes, please. So uh, we from the Taxation uh, and Sustainable Finance Working Group have put this as one of our top three policy recommendations. We have got no response on these recommendations. That is why I said that this has to be a continuing struggle yep. from here on to India and beyond. This is not something we are going to win this year, yep. perhaps not even next year, but we yep. shall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And really for the update as well. Um, we have spent a really great, at least for me, and I believe for many of you who are joining today, a very great you know, uh, almost three hours. Uh, first, listening to the great presentation of the, uh, you know, paper that is released today with us um, uh, from South Asia and from Indonesia. So we have that this discussion is really based on the latest figures and information. And then we have really a wonderful, you know, panel discussion together with, you know, joining questions and comments as well. So I would like to, you know, wrap up uh, by saying that this, for me, listening, I've been really away from the debate on tax issues, on fiscal justice for a long time, but it's really excited really to hear that, you know, this is really not an alienate issue. It's something that's been there. It's embedded in so many cultural, religious, even we hear from Samira, the, the system that is there is something that have been utilized and even many government have done it successfully. And considering it, so it's not something really out of the pictures. It's something that really would require courage, commitment, 
uh, not only by the government, but by the people, civil society people who really need to continue and really asking your government, international body to be really responsive and responsible, uh, you know, for, for to all the public. We have been, you know, ex as Josna said, experimenting on, I would say, poor rich, a pro rich, uh, you know, model for such a long time. Now it's really time to really, you know, uh, uh, trying something that really focus on on the poor, vulnerable people. And well tax could be one of the key uh, vehicle that deliver us that. Um, I wouldn't go any further, as as uh, Vidya said, is really a continued struggle. It will not be uh, something that will come really easily but it's something that's really worthwhile for us to continue fight and, and, and pursue. So um, uh, with this ending, I would like to say thanks to Tony, Josna, Vidya, uh, sorry, <laughs> Irvan, sorry, so many. and yes, of course, Samira and Suhia. Okay, thank you so much for a really great discussion and presentation today. Um, and you know, uh, 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 we, you, there will be a, a record on 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 YouTube on Pakasa channel, and you can hear it again. And uh, the report will be put online uh, for for uh, uh, available for download also. So thank you so much. A good round of applause for our speakers. And then we have our interpreters uh, uh, for hand sign and also from English to Bahasa. So thank you to our interpreters. And also the organizers, you know, who has been investing your time on the logistic work, you know, coordination, making sure that these uh, even happen again is not the one-off event, these are continued struggles and see you again soon. Thank you very much.